Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. So I just want to say thank you, um, especially for hosting the event. And then uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to be here and participate. Hopefully you'll find today most advantageous. Um, I'm going to get straight out to it because there's several uh, slides that I'd like to get through today. But um, I, I just want to drive it home because I think today is probably some of the most important information, at least just in my experience and uh, that has benefited me uh, over time. And so uh, we'll get we'll get straight out. But first and foremost, uh, of course, I want to just make note that this is for educational purposes only, guys and gals, trading contains substantial risk. And it is, of course, not for every investor. An investor could potentially lose all or more than the initial investment. And risk capital is money that can be lost without jeopardizing one's financial security or lifestyle. And only risk capital should be used for trading and only those with sufficient funds should consider trading. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results and so on. Okay, so, all right, let's uh, go ahead and get through that. And what I'm gonna try to do is move as swift as I possibly can. I wanna make sure that I have the chat and the questions and so on, uh, but if you guys can't, <clears throat> excuse me, if you can, just bear with me a little bit so that I can get through and then we'll actually get out to the live charts and uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you all have. All right, excellent. So um, I'm gonna start by giving you a little bit of an introduction to PFA. I'm sure that a lot of you may or may not be familiar with Pure Financial Academy. But welcome, super happy to be here and, and super happy that you're here. Uh, a little bit about PFA, Pure Financial Academy, of course being the acronym there, online community dedicated to supply and demand trading concepts in particular. Uh, PFA has been providing training materials and software since about 2009, so we've been doing this for a little bit. Uh, we firmly believe in the power of having others on the same path as yourself, right? It helps with support and just in general, it's nice to have that community of others that you know, there's other people out there doing the same thing, right? Our mission is to provide a positive and effective environment for traders and investors who wish to utilize supply and demand trading methods and share their experiences with others. So I just put your the contact information there up. Maybe you can go ahead and copy that. I'll be happy to, you know, post anything and everything in the chat, all the links or whatnot, uh, as maybe towards the end of the session in case you don't have time to do that now. But at minimum, just jump out there. I would encourage you to go ahead and uh, sign up for our newsletter if you haven't already. Reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to go ahead and kind of uh, prelude to the uh, to the end of this the session. We're going to have a follow up session. This is going to be on Monday. Super excited about it. So we'll actually put all of this into. Uh, we're we're going to be trading uh, on Monday. So hopefully you guys will all be able to make that, and uh, we'll be sending out the email invites and everything. So. Uh, again, I'll, I'll post that link as well towards the end of the session. Please don't let me forget. All right, so first and foremost, what are we going to be talking about today? Supply and demand imbalances, all right? And uh, keyword there being imbalance, uh, and we're going to focus solely on two patterns. Um, I would encourage you probably, we're going to go through the patterns in the beginning, right? But I would strongly encourage maybe not to focus on uh, the pattern alone towards the end of the session. Once we've covered the information, I think you'll circle back and you'll kind of understand what I mean. So it's a whole, you know, it's a, um, a plethora of information and it needs to be combined in order for it all to make sense. Okay. But first we got to cover them. So let's get out to our demand price patterns. And as I said, we're only going to talk about two, uh, of course, on the uh, supply and demand side, right? So if we look at our demand price patterns, <clears throat> in these patterns, price briefly consolidates after moving up. So if we take a, um, a little visual here, we can see price, of course, moving up. And as we state, it consolidates. And in that consolidation, as you can see here in the rectangles, uh, price, begins to accumulate, right? Specifically on the buy side. So demand being uh, buy orders, supply being sell orders. But as I said, inside of that rectangle, it's very important here, buy orders begin to accumulate inside of the consolidation. Some of this will probably make sense, some of it may not, but as I said, when we get to the end of the session, I think a lot more will. Um, okay, so continuation, right? So first we've, we've said, okay, well, here's a a pattern, if you will. These are just candles on us on a uh, chart. Could be a minute, could be tick, volume, and so on. So that it briefly consolidates, and that's how we know we're starting to see the pattern, right? 
um, and, and as we stated, inside of that pattern, it's just starting to accumulate, all right? And then the continuation. So the continuation is, you know, I would say probably the most important part, right? So the continuation occurs due to the consumption of the cell orders. So if we're moving up and then we pause, if you will, or go sideways and accumulate, the, the important distinction here is that follow through, right? The continuation is what tells us who got consumed. Was it the buyers or was it the sellers? And in this case, as we're notating demand patterns, we would indicate here that it was the sell orders that got consumed. And we know that for a fact because price indeed did move higher via that, um, the, the uh, departure is what we would call that. Okay. Let's look at su supply price patterns. As I said, I am gonna move pretty quickly so we can get out to the charts. I always enjoy it when people can actually see it in action. But as I said, Monday is gonna be definitively when we get to actually do all of that. So this, this supply price patterns, as I mentioned previously, it, the difference there being demand is on the buy side, supply is on the sell side. So price, <clears throat> excuse me, briefly consolidates. In this case, it's after moving lower. And inside here, sellers begin to accumulate inside of that consolidation. So that rectangle area, what you're seeing there, the reason that it's going sideways is an accumulation uh, of the sell side. And then finally, the continuation occurs due to the consumption, in this case, of buy orders. So if we circle back for a second, in demand, we're consuming the sellers to go higher. In supply, we're consuming the buyers to go lower. Uh, I'm literally staring at the charts as we speak, and it is unbelievable. In fact, we've had uh, three, there were three setups just in our room this morning. So, um, you know, they, there's a lot of them and it, it's applicable across all time frames. but as I'm staring at the chart, I mean, they're literally happening as we speak. Um, and it's, to me, it's unbelievable how we can sit there so that when we're looking at these patterns and we're thinking to ourselves, you know, that how simple that looks, that's exactly what I would like for you all to be thinking, how simple that looks, right? It's almost, um, you know, <laughs> It uh, kind of looks like maybe crayon, I took a, some crayons and, and drew some, you know, kindergarten pictures or whatnot, but that's okay, because that's how simple I want it to feel. Um, now that we know what the supply and demand levels are, we want to talk about qualifying them. There can be, as I always say, there can be a, an amazing, let's say, supply level, right? I mean, it can be picture perfect, but if it's in the wrong location, that level will most likely fail. Now you can go, you know, conversely and look at a relatively okay supply level, but if it's in the right location, that level is most likely to prevail. Um, so it's, you know, more about the location and when, if and when these things are occurring. So I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's always hard not to. I get so excited with these things. I love spending time doing this. So we know the price patterns, right? Please remember, I'm not all over the board here. We're not talking about 20 different patterns. We're not talking about, you know, tons and tons of information. Very simple, very basic information. Okay, so two patterns, supply pattern, demand pattern, and we're literally just looking at one on each side. Okay. All right, so now that we want to move forward a little bit, we know what the patterns are, but we need to qualify them. We don't want a a poor looking, uh, you know, let's call it non-qualified level. We, we want them to be extremely qualified. And more importantly, we want them to be in the right location. So if I have two things working in my favor, now I have an amazing looking level, but I also have it in the right location. That is, uh, that's superior, okay? So the first question, we're gonna say, did price depart from the consolidation fast or slow? Very simple question. And to be honest with you, a lot of this information, you know, we like I said, we've been doing this since about 09. You know, we used to have YouTube videos going back to 09. It's just, you know, outdated and things like that. This information, um, some of which very basic, you know, it's it's been out there. This is not, uh, we're not trying to put, you know, reinvent the wheel or throw rocket science here or whatnot. Uh, so this is a pretty, pretty standard question, um, but it may be new to, to some folks. It depends if you're, uh, you know, if you've, done a lot of supply and demand analysis or support and resistance analysis, things like that. 
So if I'm talking to a fib trader, right, they may, this might be, um, you know, quite unique. Just depends on the trading style. So what in the world does that even mean? Did price depart fast or slow from the consolidation, right? So we want to take those same patterns. On the left side, you'll see that this is the supply, right? And we know that because price is moving down. Obviously an important distinction there. On the right side, we're, we're looking at demand because price is moving up, okay? Um, in these particular patterns. Please remember there are others. I'm not in any way saying there aren't, but I don't need to focus on all the patterns. I just need to be consistent with the ones that I do focus on, okay? So how did it depart, right? This right here is a very, very important part. And we'll come back to this later in the presentation and really talk about the why behind this. But suffice to say right now, we just wanna know that is part of qualifying the level. How did it depart? Was it fast and abrupt? or slow, you know, and, and diagonal, if you will, okay? So in each case here, you can see that it goes straight up and or straight down, supply goes straight down, and the demand goes straight up. So those are, those are great, okay? The speed and the distance are going to help determine the strength and or the weakness. So if it's moving fast and for all intents and purposes, a grave distance, that's wonderful. It's super strong, right? Conversely, if it's slow, then you're going to have the opposite. It's gonna be weak. So again, we're qualifying. We, in other words, to simplify this, we want to see it break out of that consolidation and move in the corresponding direction very fast. So the faster it goes, the happier you know, we are because we're substantially qualifying our level. So we have another question we wanna ask ourselves. How many bars closed while inside of the consolidation. Now this is important before departing, right? Before departing. So if we look at those same two patterns on the left, the only thing that's missing here is the consolidation. On the right, you're gonna have demand left supply. And this will make sense on my next click here, but I need to know how many bars are inside of that consolidation, okay? <clears throat> the number of bars is going to indicate um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit distracted here as I just had a break even trigger. I'm hoping that I can get through this. I was hoping to let you all see that as it was happening, but price is moving a little bit too fast. That's okay. Uh, Monday, plenty of time. So the number of bars indicate how decisive the buyers and or the sellers were at the time of formation. Okay. So in this case, fewer bars you might think this would be the opposite, right? I don't know, but um, so less time or fewer bars equates to very decisive. They had no trouble making the decision that they made. On the left, the decision that they made was obviously stronger on the sell side because we have a supply level and price ended up moving down. On the right side, you know, of course we have a demand level. So the decision was uh, prominent on the buy side. Okay, so again, just, uh, you know, let's back up for a moment, qualifying the levels. <clears throat> we want to understand, uh, let's back up to the previous, let's see if I can just back up. I just wanna, these are only two questions, right? So did price depart fast or slow? And then how many bars closed within the consolidation? And that's basically it, right? I mean, we're simplifying this down to just a very, uh, very basic level. And at the end of the day, we can complicate it substantially, but uh, there's no there's no necessity for that. And uh, we actually don't use any, uh, what we're doing right now is exactly what, what we do. So we try to keep it that simple because price action, in our opinion, is the one thing that really can't be manipulated, right? Because what you see, it's really already occurred. Okay. All right. So we'll keep moving forward there. Now we talked about the bars within that, right? So how in the world do I even determine that? What does that even mean? So if I say that there's, you know, six bars inside of my consolidation and so on, I need to understand exactly how to go about, uh, you know, counting that, if you will. Uh, let me see here. Sorry, I see, I, uh, Oh, sorry. I, I was trying. I couldn't. Uh, the uh, Q and A there was a little blocked for me. I see your question though. 
Um, and I apologize if I miss any more, but I definitely will come back to those um, towards the end of the session. But you just joined, welcome, by the way. You're just asking what time frame are you teaching on? I'm gonna show you that in just a moment. I'll actually show you exactly what we, uh, you know, what we do in our live room. So the charts and stuff that you'll see is exactly what we do every day um, in our live room. But uh, to give you the answer as I move forward, uh, right now I'm staring at a daily chart, a four hour chart and a three minute chart. Okay. Um, and just to let you guys know, cause I think this is, I don't know if this is going to happen, but you can just watch the uh, S and P right now. I have a target at 4155 quarter. Um, it's dropping in so short from 4164 quarter with a target at 4155 quarter and the trigger line just got met so um, i may not be able to show you all this but you can keep an eye if you have a chart open maybe um again that's 4155 quarter and we'll we will uh if we don't get a chance today which i believe we will we'll absolutely do that on um on monday okay all right, so how do I count those bars in the consolidation, specifically in the demand? So I'm gonna have to break these apart because they are uh, different, of course. They're going in two different directions. So if we look at, <clears throat> we wanna determine the highest high, we're gonna look at the pattern, and we're going to determine the highest high after price moves up. So I'm not, you know, this could be any bar. It, we're not saying that you know, it has to be some specific bar or anything like that. It's literally as price is moving up, just count the high, right? Uh, or determine it, excuse me. So of any bar, doesn't matter where you are, in order to locate and define these patterns, however, we do need a, a move up, of course, and then we need to, to grab that high. So the next thing I'm going to do is adjust to each new consecutive bars high that forms. Again, this could be any bar, right? So it could, it could form in the middle of nowhere or where we think it should or whatnot, but ultimately I wanna define the high and then adjust to every new bars high, right? So every time we make a consecutive high, I'm gonna get rid of the previous because that's of no relevance anymore. I'm gonna move on to the next. So this becomes my new high, right? Same thing here, I have a new bar, but this is a red bar, you say. Well, it's a little bit different. Uh, of course, yeah, it being the color, meaning that it closed lower than it opened, but it doesn't matter because the candle in itself made a higher high. So what I would do is get rid of the previous and thereby count the new high, the new bar's high. And now what I wanna do is just continue that process. I'm just gonna keep going. So as long as it continuously makes higher highs, I'm going to move uh, that particular point, if you will, which you'll know in just a second, I'm just gonna keep moving with that. And once I finally you know, revisit a bar that fails to take out the previous bar, okay? So I'm gonna say it as I have it written, I'm gonna count the high bar plus each bar which fails to surpass the high bar's high. Simply put, so long as we don't violate that previous bar's high, I'm gonna count that bar, okay? So here I have one, let's go back. So the high bar becomes bar number one, right? And we don't know that yet. So there's no way for us to know that, okay, well that, you know, the next bar is not gonna take that bar high out. So, you know, but pretty much suffice to say, the high bar, we are consistently moving and adjusting to whatever that is, knowing that that is going to become bar number one. So then we move forward. As long as the high of said candle fails to take out the previous candle, that becomes bar number two. Same with bar number three. And then finally, we have a bar, but as you can see, this particular bar, it actually takes out the bar number one's high, right? So if I'd go back and look at that closely, we can see there it violates the previous bar number one's high, okay? So this bar does not get counted. I could say here that I have three bars inside of my consolidation. Give you another example here. We have a bar's high, and basically I'm just using the same uh, demand patterns as, as the previous slides. So we have a bar high, we have another bar high, so I'm gonna get rid of the previous 
and move and or adjust to the new consecutive bars high. Same thing occurs again, so I'm going to continue adjusting. Finally, I have a bar that fails to surpass the previous bar's high, thereby that becomes bar number two. So we have now the high bar, which is uh, bar number one. We have number two, which fails to surpass bar number one's high, and we just keep going with that same process. So in this case, we now have four, but we've never violated the bar number one high, which I refer to as the high bar. So as long as that high bar is intact, we keep counting. So here we have six, and here I'm going to stop now because that candle has violated bar one or the high bar, okay? Uh, so yes, it does not get counted. Uh, a very important distinction, none of this is done intra-bar. So as I'm doing my counting, I can't uh, count the bars intra-bar because I don't know if it's going to, to violate the high bar or not, right? So I have to wait for them to fully close and then, uh, then I can go ahead and count or not count. All right, so how do I count the supply bars? As you could imagine, I can move a little bit more swift through this one simply because uh, it's relatively the same, just inverse to one another. So we determine the lowest low after price moves down. Here you can see we have a down bar. Okay. So we're gonna determine that low, and then we're gonna just keep adjusting to each new bars, each new consecutive bar, shall I say, each new low, okay? So with there we have a, uh, a new bar low. I'm gonna adjust, uh, if I could click on the right thing there, it would probably help. <laughs> so I've adjusted to the new bars low. Then we have another bar that forms a low or a lower low, so I'm going to adjust again. Now I have a new bars low, okay? I'm going to then begin counting the low bar, so that's gonna become bar number one, plus each new bar that fails to surpass the low bars low. So as I said, it's just inverse to the demand patterns here. We have the low in, in the uh, demand, of course we have the highs that we're focused on, in supply we have the lows. So the bar low, that becomes bar number one. Number two failed to surpass, number three failed to surpass. The next bar, however, did not fail to surpass. In fact, it departed quite nicely. So I do not count that bar. Inside of this consolidation, the answer to my question, how many bars are inside of my consolidation is a very simple answer. I have three. Okay. So this would be considered a three bar uh, consolidation. Over here, I'll give you one more example. We have a down bar, so we know we're moving lower, right? So that's, that's the key thing there. We're moving lower. We must be moving lower in these particular patterns for supply, and we must be moving higher for demand in these patterns that we're referring to today, okay? All right, so the down move, we have a new low. We're going to adjust accordingly, and we're gonna continue that process until we have a failure to take out that uh, low bar in this case, until we have a failure to take out the low bar. So now we have two bars, three, and just continuing that process until we violate the low bars low. All right, so that bar, of course, does not get counted, all right? If I said, um, on the right, I'm gonna ask myself a question, or two questions, really. Number one, how did price depart, right? That was the first qualifying question. How did price depart? Well, it, just, it went vertically down, so that's good. Um, of course, we would need to see follow through. This is part of it, but using breaking out, this for illustration purposes. So uh, it broke straight down, okay, great. Now, how many bars are inside of my consolidation? So if I look at that right pattern, I can see there's six. If I look at the, the uh, left pattern, I can see that there's three. We'll discuss this further in the presentation. So it's ironic, but sellers cause demand levels. Please revert back to the beginning of the presentation when I, when I said, let's put this all together, right? So we know the demand levels. There's only you know, one on each side, so it equates to two. We, uh, we understand how to qualify them with literally two very basic questions, okay? And then we're gonna move on to understand more of the functionality of them. So again, I wanna just reiterate sellers. So this is the opposite, right? So sellers cause demand levels. That's weird, right? That sounds weird. 
because demand is buy orders, right? No, it doesn't even sound right, but it will in a moment. Price stops moving higher when sell orders are reached and cannot continue higher until 100% of the sell orders are consumed, okay? All right, so let, we'll, again, let's get through this and, and then I'll answer any questions in regards to, but let me just repeat that. Price stops moving higher, right? So here, obviously price is moving up, okay, on both of these patterns. When price stops moving up, we know for a fact that sell orders were reached because there's really no other reason to stop, right? So what is it that stops price from moving higher? It's always the same, sell orders, all right? We'll talk about the inverse of this in just a moment. So price is gonna stop moving higher. We know there, okay, oh, great. Well, sell orders have been reached. And more importantly, it cannot continue higher. There's no way, it's not possible for price to go up until all of the sell orders are consumed, okay? It just can't, I mean, literally not even one. So we have to get rid of all sell orders and then price of course will go higher, okay? <clears throat> all right, so basically I was just indicating to you there, this is where price stops, right? So we know that there are sell orders there. The high bar indicates where they are. In other words, the sellers. So we know that we've reached them when price stops and the high bar, okay, of the demand levels, that's, uh, that's what is going to indicate that for me. And the consolidation followed by continuation confirms there were not enough sellers to reverse prices direction and new demand accumulated. Okay. Um, so sometimes I have to repeat things even for myself, right? I know this like the back of my hand, but it's always good for me to read it for you and then to read it out loud for myself so that I can be a little bit more explanatory. The consolidation followed by the continuation, right? So if we're it's not enough just to have the consolidation is what I'm trying to say here. Yes, we have a consolidation, but that's only telling me that there's an accumulation of buy and sell orders. I don't know the rest of the story, right? I need more information. Thus followed, oh, sorry guys, that was, a, I'll explain that moment, the break even there. Uh, so the consolidation, but then followed by the continuation, right? So that's this part right here. And that's what confirms that there were indeed not enough sellers to reverse prices direction and thereby new demand has accumulated. We know that because we hit sellers. So in order to get through them, the buyers have to regain their composure, accumulate once more, and then your departure takes place, okay? All right, um, conversely, as I said before, we look at the inverse of uh, buyers cause supply levels. So again, that sounds really weird because we know supply is actually sellers, right? Sell orders. So buyers cause those supply levels to actually form. It's like footprint, right? Not footprint chart, but it leaves footprints on the, uh, on the charts for us. Um, it, footprints meaning levels that we can go back and historically view. So price, uh, price stops moving lower when buy orders are reached and cannot continue lower until 100% of the buy orders are consumed. So here we're moving lower, we stop, okay? So that indicates where the buyers were reached. And then the consolidation occurs followed by that same continuation, right? Very important. So that we consolidate, then continue, which confirms that there were not enough buyers in this case to reverse prices direction, thereby new supply accumulated. So there's that continuation or departure. All right, so now we wanna locate demand at resistance. I realize I'm moving very quickly, but we've already been here for 30 minutes and I only have 45. So I apologize if I'm moving too fast. Monday, we'll have all the time in the world. So let's locate demand, right? We're gonna do that at specific locations. Very important, we're putting it all together now. We're saying here's the supply and demand levels. This is how we qualify them, basic two questions. And then we're going to, to start focusing on the location, right? So we wanna look for demand to accumulate at or near previous resistance levels. So here we have a resistance level. Supply is weakened after retesting the resistance level many times, right? So when we retest that level, it is definitively removing orders from that location. Not to say they can't be added back, people replace orders, you know, and so on. 
but um, we're talking about like institutional order flow, which was initially submitted. All right, so we have that resistance level there. Could be any resistance level. We'll look at that um, a little bit more in depth. But the supply at said resistance level is weakened after retesting it. So the, the more times we retest it, the weaker it becomes. Okay, and that's basically what we're saying. So as, as supply weakens, the buyers may more easily accumulate and consume the remaining sellers. Okay, so we're saying as the supply and or sellers, they weaken because we continuously are retesting that area, then it's easier for the buyers to, you know, to violate them, right? Okay, so here we can see price consolidating. I would ask myself, you know, I need to see the departure. I need to see uh, how many bars are within that consolidation, qualifying it and so on, okay? So when I come to the resistance level, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm saying, all right, it's retesting it. Now let me start counting bars. Um, and then I'm gonna look for this right here, okay? Because now I know something that I didn't know before. It's a proven fact that the buyers have indeed consumed the sellers. So if buyers are consuming sellers, and we know that sellers are there because it's resistance, right? Uh, so if we can get through them, we know that the buyers, you know, they just accumulated. So that becomes a new level. We can focus on that. But remember the previous slide where I was saying supply, uh, you could call it and or resistance if you like, creates demand, right? It's not so much that it creates it, rather it's the location in which the demand is going to occur. So here that resistance level is sellers, right? We, there are sellers almost always at resistance levels and so on. Uh, and in order to get through them, I have to accumulate the buy side. So this is what's leading me to, okay, now I get it. Yep. So this is not just any level. This is a level that has proven something to me. Okay. So we want to locate su uh, supply at support. I, I back up one slide. Demand is at resistance. Supply is at support. Okay. So we want to look for supply to accumulate at or near previous support levels. Demand in this case is weakened after retesting the support levels many times. Same concept as we previously stated, of course, just on the other side of the market, right? So here we have a retest of the support level. So the more times that occurs, the weaker the demand becomes, thereby the sellers can now more easily accumulate and consume the few remaining, uh, you know, the few remaining buyers. Okay, so we consolidate. I'm qualifying that level as it is occurring. And that's what I want to see. And how do I want to see that? Slow or fast? Fast. Very fast. Because remember the question, and fast was very decisive, slow, indecisive, right? So I want few bars, fast departure. All right, next, and we're getting towards the end here, I want to locate demand at resistance, right? Same thing we were looking at before, but we, we already said that. Well, we did, but there's multiple types of resistance. So previously on the slide, we stated that we wanted to look for demand to accumulate at previous resistance levels, okay? But resistance, as I said, it comes in many, many fashions. In this case, we're gonna talk about a resistance line, okay? So it's when we can put a line on multiple structure highs uh, that are relatively in the same line, okay? Supply is weakened after retesting the resistance line many times. So the same concept, you can see, we have a resistance level. You get, you know, continuously retesting that, it weakens. Um, when you have here, similarly, a resistance line, you continuously retest it, it weakens, right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So there, this is where I'm looking for the demand, okay? Now, that's good. I'm not trying, it's like a, you know, looking for for sheep, right, or something, or like if you're stalking your prey as an animal or whatnot, the lion, they look for the weak of the herd, right? So they're going to go after the weak. So that's what we want to do here. I know that sounds bad and poor analogy on my part, I'm sure, but I have to use it, right? Because what we're doing is we're we're doing exactly that. We're looking for the supply to be weakened. We want it to be weakened because then it becomes much easier for the buyers to prevail. Okay. So as I'm saying there, as supply weakens, buyers may more easily accumulate and consume the remaining sellers. So this is where we consolidate. It's where we start to accumulate. 
the departure tells me it confirms it, right? Now I know. So I've been proven, uh, or rather it has been proven that demand exceeds supply. Um, and remember in the, in the very beginning of the presentation, I stated the term imbalance was very important. This is why. Because not only do I need to see the level, I need to see it form and execute uh, in a way that tells me something. I don't need random levels. I need very specific levels. Okay? I need a lot of proof, right? So I want to locate supply at support. Demand was at resistance. Supply is at support. So I want to look for supply to accumulate at or near previous support lines. We can see there we have a support line. Demand is weakened after retesting said support line many times. And then I begin looking for my supply level. Okay, so as demand weakens, sellers may more easily accumulate and consume the remaining buyers. So here we have the potential, right? Now I'm starting to count my bars. We consolidate and or accumulate on the sell side. And finally, I know for a fact that it has indeed uh, been the sellers to exceed the buyers. Okay. All right, so see, it was not too bad. It's a lot of basic information. I think I'm doing okay on time. We'll probably go ahead and get right out to the charts. Um, yeah, not too shabby then, excellent. All right, so give me just one second here. Uh, I'm going to just introduce you guys and gals to our zone suite. So everything that we talk about today, right? It, it, we talk about like automated levels and things like that. So that's what the PFA zone suite does. This is our custom software, you know, again, in, you know, in development for over a decade. Um, been doing this a long time, loads of bells and whistles. I <laughs> used to say, you know, I could do all this manually and things like that, but I have just become so accustomed, um, you know, almost dependent even on the software just because it makes my job uh, way easier. We we're talking about it in the, the uh, session this morning, how we went and changed up orders and, you know, moved things around so very fast. So it was really efficient. I was able to do it in just a few seconds. It's very nice. So this is a tool, um, an indicator, if you will. So it's NinjaTrader 8 compatible. Uh, it's designed to reduce subjectivity and increase time efficiency by automatically drawing supply and demand zones on any price chart. It utilizes price recognition, volume distribution, market volatility, and many, many other in its calculation, which are displayed on the chart with custom graphics. They can be uh, used for enhanced confluence purposes, adding, uh, it could be used for whatever. I mean, there's really no uh, trading style in our opinion that this couldn't benefit. Let's say I'm a FIB trader but I, you know, I don't even pay attention to supply and demand. Well, I think we all should, of course, where the supply and demand is in the market is, uh, is obviously very important. So if I'm about to hit, you know, based on my Fibonacci pattern, if I'm about to hit, uh, you know, an ABC long, I know that terminology, I shouldn't say. So let's say I'm about to hit a pullback and I'm, I'm looking to go long or buy again, okay? Well, having this on my chart, I may see that there's a huge red zone right there in front of me. And that indicates, hey, you're buying right into supply, right? So it just helps uh, always kind of, you know, trying to keep us on the right side of things, right? And our thought process intact. Uh, of course, you can keep track of historical data. Uh, it's fully back testable, right? So everything is, uh, uh, so I know some indicators work a little bit differently, but ours is all historical and you can track everything. Okay, so that's the zone suite. I wanted to do a little introduction. I'm gonna get through these slides very fast. Here's the uh, the link that, let me get this to you real quick. And let's see. Anna, if you can help me out here, I would be most appreciated. If you could post that to everyone. It, it, again, it would be most appreciated. I put it in the chat, but I think it's set to maybe go only to you or something. Sure. Uh, so that's, there's the link there. I thank you so much. Um, if you just want to sign up for the free events, you can do so on that, uh, that link there. So as I said, we'll be putting this into action uh, on Monday, looking forward to it. And uh, we'll get, get out into the, the live markets and just have some fun, okay? But there's the link for that as promised. Um, and I'm gonna keep going. I wanna throw this out there for you just before the session ends. I'm trying to, to get to it as quickly as possible. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. Uh, but of course, we want to at least provide you with a discount for your time and, and uh, you know, putting in the effort to be here today and listening to, you know, to me ramble and so on. Most appreciated. Um, in uh, on the indicator side, so if you wanted the software alone, 
there's a couple things which we'll discuss in further and greater uh, links and depth on Monday. But for now, uh, you can grab the discount code Investor Expo. And if you decide to purchase the Zone Suite, we're going to include the hedger, uh, which is a very nice feature, in our opinion, allows us to, to essentially look at both sides of the market. We can talk more on Monday. Um, but you're going to get a, a very large discount on that. So that's usually $19.96. But today, uh, and uh, going into about 48 hours, that'll be $13.97.20 only. Okay. So that's number one. Just grab that discount code, as I said. If you're already interested in PFA, then there you go. Here's a great time to, to go ahead and join. Now, if you're interested in our community, this is where we have the mentorship, the live room, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of every week. There's a full-blown course, which is extremely extensive, takes uh, quite a while to get through it, uh, video format, so hopefully it's enjoyable, <laughs> quizzes and so on. Uh, but anyway, all of that is included, the software, as you can see there, based on the information we've uh, notated. Uh, it's also included in that. So if you wanted the software, but you also want the community, don't go purchase the software and then, you know, you don't need to do both. Okay. So all of the inclusions are there. Uh, and the one year of PFA community is normally $19.99. Today, it's only $15.99.20. And if you want to do the lifetime uh, community, then we're going to provide that for only $39.99.20, whereas normally it's $49.99. Also, we're going to include the PFA hedger, which is pretty uh, pretty substantial on the discount side. Okay. All right. Again, grab that uh, discount code Investor Expo, capital I, capital E. All right. And then this is the course that I was referring to, loads and loads of lessons and things to that extent. Uh, but we can come back. I have like three minutes. So let me stop the, uh, the sharing here. Um, Okay, so I think I've stopped the sharing. Let me see if I can get out here. Did I do it? Am I good? <laughs> Thank you so much, and I appreciate that. And uh, are you guys seeing my charts? Can I just get a quick uh, yes or why or whatever? Anything works, really? All right, I'm looking in the chat. Uh, just want to make sure that I'm not. Let's see. Okay. Uh, can, can you guys help me out? Okay, I do. I do see, I'm sorry. So see, this is, yeah, I can't really see the questions, guys. This is going to be a little bit problematic. I can't see the questions and you guys and gals typing, um, which is most unfortunate. But I Monday, I'm telling you, we'll absolutely get to all of the questions. Um, it, I don't know what's wrong with the uh, the GoTo webinar thing here, but it's blocking all of your uh, of your questions. So let me do this real quick, okay? There you go. Shoot an email over, uh, as promised. I get you the contact information. Shoot an email over. Any questions? I'll be happy. I'll even have a one-on-one a -on -one personal conversation with you if you like. Um, and you can just shoot me an email, and we'll set up a time. I'll call or or we can email back and forth, however you like, okay? Real quick, in conclusion, and as I said, on Monday, we'll be talking about all of this, but in the final minute, I'm getting down to it. Uh, these were the three setups. So as you can see here, our software is printing it, right? You see that line there? These are very specific patterns, um, and based on location and the information that we've discussed today and, and further information, which we can discuss on Monday, uh, these are the three setups that have occurred today. So we had two shorts this morning, followed by a long, right? So very short-term trades here based on larger time frame and smaller time frame. And you can see all the previous stuff setting up right now. Uh, so this is where my trade previously was right in through here. So that was a short setup there. Uh, and then the target was just down here, but it, uh, so it hit the trigger line right here into this demand, pulled back to our supply level. That's where my break even, that's what you heard go off moments ago. And then, uh, you know, it took me out at break even plus commissions, but still looking for that lower target. Okay, God bless you all. I sincerely appreciate your time. I really hope that it was a benefit today, but on Monday, I will dive so deep um, and do my best to help you all uh, with any questions, answers, anything like that. I want to thank you again for your time, your participation, uh, and your willingness to listen to me go on uh, and do my best to help. Okay.
Thank you. Bye for now. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me and welcome everybody. Looks like we've got a big, big group on today with us. Uh, so good morning uh, to, to most of you. Probably, you know, those of you on the East Coast, it's afternoon, I suppose, but good afternoon to you. And uh, today we're going to be talking about how to fix losing options trades. So uh, here at Altos Trading, we do a lot of different uh, types of trading, different markets, futures, uh, options, equities. Um, and today we're going to be mainly focusing in, on options. So uh, put a big Y in the chat box if you're an options trader or traded options in the past or considering trading options. They're a, a popular market today. We're going to talk a little bit about, um, about that. It looks like we've got a lot of options traders out there. Great, great. Um, so uh, I'll read a quick disclaimer before we get into all the fun stuff. Uh, we know that trading securities and options involves risk. Prior to buying or selling, an option investor must receive a copy of characteristics and risk of standardized options. Investors need a broker to trade securities and options and must meet suitability requirements. Past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance. Uh, and we will be going over some performance figures today, which may be based on actual trades or hypothetical results. Of course, due to the time critical nature of trading, brokerage fees, and the activity of other subscribers, there's no guarantee that subscribers will mirror our performance. Performance numbers shown are based on trades users could enter based on the trade signals. So we're going to be going over some different strategy, um, different different types of uh, signals and adjustments for fixing bad options trades. We, unfortunately, we all have bad trades, and uh, and and the the purpose of our time together today is to uh, confront those and learn how to deal with them. So before we start that, I want to I want to uh, kind of have like a little interactive quiz here. Uh, this is not actually trading related directly. You'll see how it ties in here in a second. Uh, so pull up your chat or your Q&A. Let me know what these two products have in common. WD-40 and the Nintendo gaming system. If you were born in the 80s or before, you'll recognize that antiquated uh, <laughs> gaming system. <clears throat> Does anyone know what these two, two products have in common? See the wheels turning, the red button. Chef Mike says dollars. I like the red, I've never gotten the red button before. That's a good one, very observant. One is still in use. A lot of good answers there, uh, but EG just says I'm stumped. Okay, it, it's not an easy one to guess. So what do the what what do WD forty and Nintendo have in common? I was curious if I, if if anybody had seen this pre my presentation before, and uh, was going to be able to get it because they know the answer. But the answer is that they actually both of these products were major failures at one point, believe it or not. So uh, you know, Ninten Nintendo obviously has become a very successful brand. Um, and it's known as the gaming company that launched an era uh, of of gaming that led to so many other gaming consoles and this uh, enormous industry of of home gaming. But it didn't actually start out as a success. In fact, uh, their first offering, which was the Famicom console, be surprised if many people have heard of that. Um, it had to be recalled after only a few months. It was barely on the market. And then that that led to uh, you know the launch of Atari. So we started getting you know more more uh, people coming into the industry in the mid 80s, um, which also kind of just left the whole industry in a mess. Um, it was really at its infancy. Um, and believe it or not, the Nintendo NES, uh, when, when Nintendo came out with that system, barely sold. Um, it was also a big failure in the mid 80s. Um, but then something interesting happened. They made, you know, after all these failures and uh, to launch this, this product, they made a little tweak to their business model and they introduced these two little characters you see on the screen, Mario and Luigi. And that was what it took to change the history of American gaming forever. So they were so focused on the mechanics of the system and 
how it was built and what it looked like, that they really neglected the, the, the key component, which was the gaming aspect, the, the human interaction and interface and entertainment part of it. And that's where the, the tweak to the business model and focusing more on the software component of it and, and the entertainment aspect completely changed it. And then they be, went on to become one of the most successful home gaming systems in the world. Well, somewhat similar story with WD-40, right? So have you ever wondered where WD-40 got its name? Does anybody know? Mike says, reminds me of Steve Jobs. Yeah, exactly. How did WD-40 get its name? It comes from the fact that the formula represents the 40th attempt to create a degreaser and rust protection solvent. So again, a very well-known, successful household product. It actually failed 39 times before it became the number one selling home lubricant. Pretty crazy. So it was originally actually used in the aerospace industry um, among its employees, and they began using it for home home use. Obviously, you can see it stops squeaks, removes, protects uh, you know, metals, and loosens rusted parts, and all these uh, universal uses that this product has. But it it didn't do well for a long time um, until they packaged it in the aerosol cans in 1958. So imagine if they'd given up after 39 tries, we wouldn't have WD-40, right? So the way this this is obviously uh, seems to be unrelated to trading and investing, but the way that this really relates is that you know trading and investing is a business, and all businesses have failures at some point, and so really it's about over overcoming those failures that lead to ultimate success. So the way that this ties into our our time together today is we're going to address the fail the failure aspect of trading so what happens when things go wrong and how do we fix it to make to make you know to make it right and to to allow us, ourselves to become successful and luckily we're not going to have you know to, tr to to fail 39 times with a trade to get it right but we're going to talk about how we can fix the bad trades and so when we look at why do why do so few traders make it well there's a lot of reasons from you know capital allocation, risk to, you know risk tolerance, um, psychology, all these things that uh, you know variables that tie into our success or failure as traders and investors. Um, so there can be a lot of causes of failure, but when you boil it down, it's really the losing trades that wipe out profits from our winning trades that results in the low success rate for traders and investors. Right, so it's an and inevitability, we're going to have losing trades, um, and we're probably going to have some winning trades. But we need to have a positive trade expectancy. We need to have a plan in place to do, do you know, to to make an adjustment to our business when things go wrong. Um, and and particularly nowadays, with you know most brokers being commission free, we have very low overhead. You know, you need a computer and an internet connection and a brokerage account, and of course some risk capital. But um, beyond that, once we have our those sunk costs in place, there's very little overhead in trading, except for our losing trades. That's our biggest overhead we face in the trading business. So the goal should be to minimize and limit losing trades and maximize successful trades. And what I found the best way to do that is to have a backup plan and a way to adjust losing trades. So there's the good news. And we've demonstrated this um, in a very long track record of thousands of trades. Up to 75% of losses in the strategies that we're going to focus on today can be fixable and avoidable. So we can't fix every bad trade. There are still going to be losing trades. But a lot of the bad ones can actually be fixed and turned around. And actually, as you'll see here, I'm going to demonstrate on our time together today, can be turned around into a better situation than they would have uh, resulted in if no adjustment was made to the trade. So that's huge. So some losses are simply a cost of doing business in the trading world, but a lot of them can be avoided and even turn into profitable trades by making a few simple tweaks. So 
we're going to look at some common option strategies like the iron condor. So if any of you have ever traded an iron condor, um, it can be a great strategy in the right market conditions. But when things go, go wrong and they, you know, uh, as they inevitably will at some point and the market moves against you, in this case, an iron condor in the S&P 500 index, the SPX, blows through one of your spreads and all of a sudden you're, you're sitting on a loss, in this case, a $3,900 loss. You could either take that loss and move on to the next trade, but what if you could tweak it, make an adjustment to the trade and turn it into a $2,400 winner? Or what about a credit spread? Credit spread, another uh, commonly traded multi-leg option strategy by uh, you know, new and seasoned trade options traders alike. Um, I still trade these. Um, they're a great strategy. Downside is when they move against you, your losses can be larger than your potential wins. So the ability to adjust the trade is crucial. So let's say you had a losing credit spread on the NASDAQ 100 ETF, the Qs, that was down 580 bucks. And rather than just take the loss and walk away, you can make a tweak to the trade and turn it into a $620 winner. Or how about a naked put? Another one of my favorite strategies, selling puts for income. Let's say you sold a put on Sienna. The stock dropped, went below your strike price. You're sitting on a $730 loss. But what if you could tweak that, make an adjustment, and turn it into a $540 winner? Well, we're going to go over some of the these different uh, techniques that were used in these cases because they're not hypothetical. They're actual uh, real world examples that we uh, issued to our members where that we were in a losing trade position. And then we also issued an adjustment to the losing trade. And these were the results based on 10 contracts. So let's look at some, some real, real world, real money example. This is from my own personal account. I, I rarely share my personal brokerage account information, but I'm gonna show you an example of uh, how, how option adjustments can make a huge difference. Does anyone recognize or recall the date down here, August 24, 2015, and what happened on that day? Does anyone know? It's a ways back, like seven years ago. Actually, it was seven, exactly seven years ago yesterday. Yeah, the flash crash of 2015, August 24, 2015. So if you were trading back then, you'll remember the Dow opened down a record, I think gap down like over a thousand points. We had this major flash crash, um, the market tanks. If you, you know, were holding positions in your account, there was nothing you could really do because the market gap way down, right? Well, there is something you can do. Um, so the, all, I have about, I don't know, a dozen positions here in my account at the time, um, all on individual equities or ETFs. And these are all naked puts or short puts. So we're gonna go into that strategy here in just a second. But I had sold puts on about a dozen different uh, assets here. And you'll notice that they were all down, some of them significantly over 12%, over 10%, over 14%, they were all down, right? But if you look at my P&L for the day, and I, by the way, I took this just six minutes into the open, I, I'm in the mountain time zone. I, I, sh I had an open P&L of over $7,600. So if, you, if you're familiar with the short put, when the stock goes down, I should be losing money. So how did I have a, an open P&L of over $7,600 when all 12 or so of the positions in my account were down big with a trade adjustment that I'm gonna teach you today? So there's an adjustment to fix virtually every bad options trade. Um, often there's multiple adjustments. Um, and over the next hour, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reveal a few of my most effective adjustment techniques to fix losing options trades. So we're gonna look at you know taking like a credit spread um, that's losing money and executing a delta neutral hedge 
to turn it into a winner or a, a short put like we just looked at in my personal brokerage account, executing a horizontal roll um, on a losing short put position to turn it into a winner. Or you, you can, again, really adjust virtually any option strategy. You can even adjust simple long calls and long puts. Um, and there's a number of ways to do those. One is um, to convert them into a vertical spread. Um, so we'll look at a few of the uh, uh, examples of how to do that today on our session. So before we get into that, I'll give you a little background on myself. Um, my name, again, is Jeff Tompkins. I'm the Chief Investment Strategist of Altos Trading. I have 23 years of experience trading the stock options and futures markets. Uh, I received my professional training as an intern at the trade desk at Morgan Stanley. Um, we currently have over 50, or sorry, 60,000 members uh, in our network uh, in over 100 countries across the globe. Um, I'm also a hedge fund manager. I manage uh, uh, money for my, for my clients at Altos Capital. Um, and I'm the manager of some of the top performing options and equity alert services out there on the market today. And we're gonna be going over a lot of the strategies uh, that we use um, in our uh, alert services with our Altos members. Um, so by the end of our session, you're gonna discover how to fix losing options trades and even turn some of those into big winners. And I'll reveal some of my top trade adjustment tricks to reduce risk and increase potential profit. So whether you're just starting out or you're a seasoned pro, this is really must have inf information for today's markets, especially for today's markets, because um, volatility has just been unusually elevated, um, particularly in 2022, and uh, is likely to remain elevated for, for some time. We have obviously had entered bear market territory this year on all the major indices, uh, and this has created a lot of challenges for options traders. Uh, and this is kind of an interesting thing that happened um, over the last couple of years as we've been in this major pandemic. And uh, uh, reports have come out from a lot of the major uh, brokerage, uh, brokerage houses and things looking at the explosion of uh, option, uh, you know, retail options volume. So, you know, how many, how many uh, uh, people are trading options and how many contracts are changing hands um, since the start of the pandemic, and it's um, exploded dramatically. So there's a lot of new uh, uh, participants coming into the market, mainly from the retail side. Um, and Piper Sandler reported, uh, and this was back in late 2020, so um, kind of earlier on in the explosion of the options market, uh, but uh, equity options volume was up uh, over 50% compared to the previous year, 2019. Um, and, and so there was a lot of new, a lot of people that are new to options trading. Um, and, and that's exciting. It pumps liquidity to the market and creates you know opportunity for all of us, but, uh, it's also a bit frightening because options trading is not easy. Uh, it, you know, it took me, uh, well over a decade to, to really become proficient and consistent with options trading. And one of the things that allowed me to do that were, were trade adjustments. So it wasn't until I started to learn to make tweaks and adjustments to my trades um, that, that you know, things really turned around for me. And, and that's why I'm here for, for you guys, to help you do the same. So if you're one of these you know, newer options traders, or even if you've been trading options for a long time and haven't uh, you know, learned how to adjust these types of trades, um, you'll, you'll I'm confident you'll find it will make a huge difference in your bottom line. Um, so let's start looking at a, a couple different popular option strategies and how we can uh, adjust those when things go wrong. So I mentioned one of my favorite strategies is selling puts for income. Um, and so uh, this is this is a great strategy, but like any other strategy, it, it carries risk with it when not uh, handled appropriately. Uh, so I'll kind of go over the background of what the strategy is. Um, and and then we'll look at you know some bad case scenarios and how we can uh, and have overcome those. Um, so basically, a naked put or a short put is uh, when you sell the open put options. Okay, so you're an option seller versus an option buyer, and you collect a premium or credit in your brokerage account for entering this trade. Um, and so when the stock rises, which is which is our goal, um, the put options that you sold expire out of the money, and you get to keep the entire premium you collected when you sold them. So here's just a basic example. Let's say you sold, you know, a put on ABC stock that's trading at $100 per share. So if you were to sell to open 10 out of the uh, uh, 10 uh, contracts of the out of the money 95 strike, um, and you collected 250 per contract, and let's say they expire in a couple of weeks. Well, since each contract controls 100 shares of stock, you receive an immediate deposit of $2,500 in your brokerage account, less any commissions or fees that you would pay. 
Um, and now as long as that stock closes above $95, because that's our strike price at the expiration, you keep the $2,500 premium you received when you initiated the trade. So it kind of works the opposite of buying, right? If you're an option buyer, you have to, uh, you know, fork out money to buy the option and then hope that the directional move takes place. Um, and then if it does, it has to do so to a certain magnitude for you to reach a certain profit target. Um, it works the opposite with option selling, right? You're, you're, you know your profit potential up front and you're taking that money into your brokerage account right off the bat. And then the goal is to keep it. So um, you're basically on the other side of the coin there. Um, now there's some common misconceptions with this strategy. Um, there's a common misconception that selling naked puts is extremely risky. Uh, well, like anything else, it can be if it's mismanaged. Um, and, and uh, you know, capital allocation, risk tolerance, all those things are just as important as they would be with any other strategy. But the truth is selling puts for income has a similar risk profile to buying stock or writing covered calls. Um, so if you look at the risk graphs or risk profiles of these uh, strategies, not many people are going to tell you that a covered call strategy is a risky option strategy, even though it has the same risk profile as a short put. Um, so where you can really get yourself in trouble with any of these strategies is over leveraging, right? But if you uh, stay within your risk tolerance, they have the same risk profile. Um, and then when done correctly, it really can be an incredibly consistent method for collecting income from the options market. And I've used it that way for many years. Um, in fact, it's how Warren Buffett often acquires stock. Uh, and we're not going to get into uh, you know, selling puts for a stock acquisition, but that's another way they, that they can be used um, in addition to uh, collecting options income. All right, so there are some major differences between selling options and buying options. Um, selling options typically has a better statistical odd than a casino has over its customer. Um, and that's, you know, uh, really important. We all know that, you know, there's mathematical advantage built into the st statistical edge a casino has over its customers. That's how they build these billion dollar, uh, you know, multi-billion dollar monstrosity hotels in Las Vegas, right? They're, they're doing that off of the, largely off the revenue of the gamblers. So they, they know that they're going to make money over time. Um, and if you look at the actual mathematical statistical edge we can have as an options seller, it can be statistically better than a casino, right? So um, that's pretty big once you realize that. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for it. Uh, number one, we have a lot more ways you know, to be successful. Um, we really have three ways to, to win. The stock can go up, it can stay flat, or it can move down against us slightly, right? Um, whereas if you're a buyer, those the, the, the two latter um, outcomes would result in either no money earned or a loss, right? So we have more ways to win um, and it allows time decay to work in our favor, which is the biggest enemy of an option buyer. So there's more room for error and it's typically easier to adjust, right? And again, that's the, the, that's the, the key topic of our session today, right? What, what do we do when things go wrong? We need a backup plan and we need uh, a strategy that allows us to make um, effective and profitable adjustments. So rather than relying on a hope and a prayer, which is what unfortunately a lot of traders do, um, and it's really what separates um, you know, the amateur trader who's just kind of you know, going in without a game plan and no backup plan when things go wrong to uh, somebody who is prepared and ready to make adjustments when things go wrong. Um, so rather than crossing our fingers with one exit strategy, either win or take a loss, um, we need to have a backup plan um, and uh, increase our trade expectancy and our long-term consistency. Uh, and we're gonna now get into how to do that. So what happens when things go wrong? Um, so we, we need to have two uh, exit strategies. So anytime we enter a trade, um, in this case, uh, and the strategy we're looking at right now is selling a put. Um, when things go correctly, which fortunately they do most of the time um, with put selling and the way that we implement the strategy. In fact, 85% of the time, we don't need to adjust this trade. So it's a relatively small percentage of trades that go bad that we need to adjust. Um, and that's where the put expires out of the money. So again, going back to that example we just looked at, you keep 100% of the premium, right? You don't need to do anything. You just let it sit there and you keep the money in your brokerage account, all right? But what about the 15% of the time that doesn't happen? Well, then we need to make an adjustment to the trade. So one of our favorite adjustment strategies often results in even greater profits 
than we would have received if we were successful off the bat, right? If we just use pr primary exit strategy number one, put expired out of the money, we don't need to make an adjustment, we keep the credit. But when things go bad, I'm gonna show you how it's possible to actually do even better. That sounds kind of counterintuitive, right? How do you how do you end up better off when things went wrong? All right, so we're gonna look at uh, a couple of ways to make adjustments. Uh, one is rolling. So rolling involves closing out the initial trade and opening a new trade at a further out expiration. So we're not increasing our risk. We're using the same number of contracts, same strike price. Um, we're just extending the time horizon, okay? But there's another key component. We're doing it for an equal or greater credit, net credit or deposit into our account. That's key. And I'm gonna, you'll see that here in an example. And it's this one adjustment technique that we've used in one of our alert services that has resulted in 294 closed trades, 294 winners out of 294 closed trades. And that includes adjustments. So again, we've had to adjust, you know, around 13 to 15% of those. All right, so we, we have not closed a trade with a net loss since the inception of our service. I'm gonna go over the results for you, with you as well. Another way to adjust is with Delta Neutral Hygiene. That's another adjustment technique we're gonna look at today. Um, a little bit more complex, uh, but basically in order to transform a naked put into a Delta Neutral position, you have to buy to open enough at the money or near the money put options to offset or as closely, you know, as close as you can, offset the positive Delta of the existing short put option. Um, and this is where you can actually um, really make a killing if things work out um, with, with the adjustment. And we're, we're gonna look at an example of that. In fact, this is the adjustment that I used back on August 24th, 2015 of the, of the flash crash. Um, so first let's start out by looking at a rolling adjustment. So this is an actual uh, real world example that we issued to our members at Altos um, back on September 12th, 2019. So we, we alerted our Altos members to sell puts on Micron with an August week four expiration at the 4450 strike. And for that, they would receive a $55 per contract credit. So let's just, for example, sake, say we're trading 10 contracts. Okay, so you collect $550 when you enter the trade. Okay, that goes into your brokerage account. In this particular case, Micron moved against us. So on September 27th, it was trading below 4450. So what we did is we rolled the contracts out for a $1.19 debit to the October week two expiration, same strike price, but look what happened. We collected a net credit, so $216 per contract. So there was a 119 debit and a 216 credit, okay? And there's a lot of reasons we don't have time to get into today, um, mainly around implied volatility that allow you to execute this adjustment for a net credit, all right? So um, th this was a, a relatively quick and simple adjustment. Less than a month later, um, we were our members were able to close this out. So. Uh, October 11th at a 52 cent debit using this one rolling adjustment. But here's the key. And, and one of the beauties of collecting a net credit, which we call staying net cash positive, the stock actually never re recovered back above the strike price. So when we so when the members sold the puts on Micron, it was trading well above 4450. So it dropped a lot. Um, and it didn't even recover back above the strike, the 4450 strike at expiration. It was trading at 43.59 when the position was closed. But because we were able to roll this for a net credit, the total profit potential on 10 contracts was $820. So remember back on September 12th when the trade was entered, the profit max profit potential was $550 per, per 10 contracts. But the end result was 820 per 10 contracts. Just, just by this using this one adjustment. And it, and it works its magic because it allows you to stay net cash positive when done correctly while taking advantages of decreases in implied volatility increases in the underlying share price. And again, this, the stock doesn't have to recover back above the strike price or even the price that the stock was trading at when you entered the trade. So that's the key with rolling. Say, uh, and, and in some cases we can roll down, but typically we stay same strike price, same number of contracts. So we're not increasing our risk exposure. We're just increasing time and taking advantages of changes in implied volatility. So let's go back to October 24th, 2015. Day of the flash crash, markets are crashing. I have about a dozen or so short put positions in my account. They're all tanking. 
But what am I doing? I'm quickly executing delta neutral hedges. So this is the another adjustment. And these again are all short put positions. So I'm going to give you a calculation to, that can let you execute a delta neutral hedge. And you can delta neutral hedge virtually any option strategy. So I'm going to show you how it was done with the short puts. Because um, we use this strategy with credit spreads, iron condors, et cetera. Um, so basically, you take the number of contracts you have in your trade, um, and you multiply it by the delta times 100. So that's going to give you your position delta. And I'll, I'll show you kind of an example here. Just want to give you the formula first. Um, you then divide the at the money option delta. So that's the strike price that's trading closest to the current underlying stock price. And you divide that by the position delta to get the number of contracts to buy. So by a, a delta hedge is where we're buying, uh, we're going long at a different strike to hedge our short put position. And what that results in is a position that can actually profit when the underlying security continues to decline in price. So I'll just give you kind of a, an example here, um, generic example. Let's say that we sold puts on this particular equity at the 58 strike. The stock has dropped well below $58 a share. So our 58 strike puts are now trading in the money. That's what we don't want to happen when we sell a, a put, right? We want the stock to go up and we want the 58 strike to be trading out of the money, but that didn't happen in this case. So um, what we do is we take that delta and puts have a negative delta, calls have a positive. You can ignore the positive negative delta, just take the number, in this case, 0.59 is the delta at the 58 strike, right? And then we run it through the multiplication. So um, it's gonna be based on your number of contracts. And by the way, guys, most likely you're not even gonna have to calculate this. If you trade options or have an options broker, um, they they give you your position delta in your uh, in your platform, but I just want to show you kind of how to how to run the calculation here. Um, so with ten contracts, you'd have a position delta of five hundred and ninety. So then we're going to take the at the money delta. So that's the fifty seven strike, which has a delta of 0.48, and we're going to divide that into the position delta, and that gives us our delta neutral hedge number. So that's twelve point two nine. Okay, we can't buy 12.29 contracts. So we're just going to round up or down to the closest number. So we'd round down to 12. So we know we need to buy 12 57 strike puts to delta neutral or hedge our fifth short 58 strike puts. All right. That's how we figure out how to delta neutral hedge our original options trade. And this is exactly what I did around the flash crash. Saw the market tanking. Delta neutral hedge turned a bunch of losing positions that were going down into profitable positions. So those are a couple really effective adjustment techniques um, for, for selling puts. And again, they can be applied to other strategies as well. And we're gonna look at another strategy here. Um, but rolling is a really effective strategy when done correctly. Um, because as I showed you in that Micron example, you don't have to recover past your short strike in order to be profitable. So the key is we need to stay net cash positive and that's done by taking advantages of changes in implied volatility and um, volatility skew uh, to achieve net credits over time that can offset the debits, all right? So we may extend the time horizon of our trade beyond what we maybe initially expected, but we're not throwing in the towel we're, we're making logical, mathematical uh, decisions to, uh, to, to go to work and attempt to fix a bad trade, one that didn't work out the way that we initially intended. Um, so another one of our uh, favorite strategies are credit spreads and iron condors. So it's another option selling strategy where you collect a credit, but these are uh, a, bit, a little bit more complex because they're vertical spreads, right? They involve more than one leg. So a credit spread is uh, you know, buying and selling uh, two different strike prices within the same expiration, you receive a credit um, for that, which is why it's called a credit spread. So you get a deposit into your account. The goal is to keep that deposit through expiration. Um, and then we have an iron condor, which is basically the combination of two credit spreads, a bear call spread and a bull put spread. So it's more of a market neutral strategy where you would um, open a bull call spread and a, and a, a, a bear call spread and a bull put spread um, on a, maybe a channeling stocker in a sideways ranging market. Both can be great strategies, but 
they do have some disadvantages, right? Oftentimes, the uh, risk is greater than the reward. So in order to have a positive trade expectancy and a mathematical edge, we need to be able to make adjustments to these trades. Otherwise, it's very difficult to make money with credit spreads in our condors over the long term. But one of the reasons I love them, because unlike most other option strategies where you really have to hit a bullseye in terms of timing, in terms of uh, getting all the Greeks correct, um, directional movement, magnitude of movement, uh, applied volatility, um, you got to be right on all of those things to make money with as an option buyer. Credit spreads, we don't have to hit the bullseye necessarily. We can really throw darts all over the dartboard and we can really throw them even off the dartboard when we know how to make adjustments to them. So how do we adjust a credit spread or iron condor? Um, again, we can use delta neutral hedging. So we'll look at an example of that. Um, and it can actually produce winning trades with a profit greater than the initial credit, just like we looked at with the rolling adjustment on short puts. Um, when uh, it's done correctly and things work out the way that we intend. So here's an example. On June 15th, we sent, this is another actual alert we sent to our Altos members, um, a, an alert to sell an iron condor on the S&P 500 index, SPX, with a June week five expiration. The initial credit was $110 per contract. So let's just, again, say we traded 10 contracts, you receive a credit of $1,100 in your brokerage account. Um, in this case, and this was a, a, I like to share our drastic cases, the ones that really were bad. Um, 10 days later, the S&P just blew through the 27, 25 strike puts, right? That's what we don't want to happen. We want this, the, the, the S&P, the SPX, to stay in between our strikes, right? But it didn't happen. So if you traded 10 contracts, um, it, the, the position was down $3,900. But we used the delta neutral hedge adjustment in this case. So we alerted our members to uh, close half of the 27, 25 strike puts. So what this does is it ne uh, neutralizes the delta on the short put side. And, and so if the S&P continues to drop, our long puts will uh, start to make up for any loss in the short puts and outpace that loss. And in this case, only a day later, one day after making the adjustment, as the S&P continued to sell off, our members were able to close the iron condor for $240 per contract, turning that what would have been a $3,900 loss if you just closed the position, as most people would have done, into a $2,400 per ton, 10 contracts winner, right? So that's using a delta neutral hedge. And that's one way to delta neutral hedge is by closing a portion of your short puts to neutralize the delta on the long, the long puts. Or if the, if the S&P had shot way up, we could have done the opposite with the call spread. Um, we're running a little short on time, so um, I have a lot to get through. This is another example, but on, on Apple, um, and I'm gonna kind of breeze through it. Um, this would be for a credit spread. So there's this obvious resistance level around 125.50. So if you open a bear call credit spread above this level or right above it or at it, um, it would have been a bad situation as you see there um, just a few days later is Apple because it is kind of in, working in the opposite direction, right, to the upside where the stock just blew through the spread to the upside, right? So if you'd open that 125, 127 uh, call spread, um, as Apple moves up through it, the credit initially would have been 590 bucks. But shortly after, when Apple blew through the spread, you'll see that it experienced almost a max loss, down $560. Think it only lose, um, well, sorry, not a max loss, a 100% a, loss on credit received. So um, you've lost almost your entire profit potential right on that initial move, right? Um, so this is another way to do a, a delta neutral hedge. And in this case, plugging in an equal number of contracts that strike in between the two to neutralize the delta on the call credit spread and as Apple continues to move up, the initial spread lost money, right? So if we just hadn't adjusted this trade, you would have lost the maximum amount, about 1400 bucks. But the adjustment, as you can see there at the 126 strike, picked up $6,300 on that move. So the whole trade with the adjustment would have netted nearly $5,000 versus 
option A, which would have been not to adjust the trade and take a $1,400 loss. So another way to do a delta neutral head adjustment, another example. Um, so here's some tips on adjustments. Um, and we kind of went through two different types, a defensive adjustment and an aggressive adjustment. Again, they can be, uh, there's lots of different adjustments, you know, not just these two. Um, and they can be used in many different types of situations and scenarios, and they can be both defensive and offensive. So we've gone over kind of a more defensive uh, adjustment technique, which would be the rolling and more of an aggressive one, which would be delta neutral hedging. Uh, but the key is that you want it to match the strength of the move and the underlying security, right? So um, you don't want to just kind of blindly adjust the trade. It's important to do it to match the, the move in the market. So if the market's in a sharp decline, a delta neutral hedge um, may be more appropriate. And in some of the examples I showed you, they can really be effective in, in uh, turning a losing trade into a big winner. Um, if it's just kind of a minor breach of a spread or um, you know, the stock's just not quite behaving the way you expected and moving against you a bit. Um, in that case, maybe rolling might be a more appropriate uh, adjustment. So it's really important that you match it. Um, and, and it's important, you know, you know, how to execute, or not just how to execute, but when and what to uh, execute, right? How to do the adjustment is important, but when and which one to use is, is also very crucial. So we've gone over a lot today, uh, a lot of information. Um, but hopefully you can see that you don't always have to take a loss. Yes, losses are inevitable in trading. And even with adjustments, we're gonna have losses. Um, but statistically, we found that a very high percentage of, of our trades that don't initially work out can be adjusted. Um, and there are lots of different types of adjustments to first fix virtually every bad options trade. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility with these, which is one of the reasons I love options. Um, and so I've revealed to you a few of my most effective adjustment techniques to fix losing options trades, right? Um, and so what I'd like to do is invite you, in, anyone who's interested to continue with us to learn more about trade adjustments as they happen in real market environments, right? Um, so we put together a package where we will send you 12 to 15 trade alerts per month. So you get about an average of uh, one trade alert per week so we're throwing in a bundle of three of our most successful and popular services, all right? Um, so you get our put rider trades, our credit spreads, our iron condors, and we're also throwing in our stock alerts. Um, if you uh, don't trade options and you trade stocks, we're gonna throw those in as well. Um, so we have relatively short holding periods of about 14 days. Um, we ha Our average win rate, uh, is over 85%. In fact, I'm gonna go over real quickly. I'm short on time, but I'm gonna go over some results here. Um, and as I mentioned, we've closed 294 winners out of 294 closed recommendations on our put rider service using adjustments. So they're very effective, right? So we launched that service um, almost seven years ago, okay, towards the end of 2015, which is why we only had seven trade alerts in 2015, All right? So this is the tracker on 10 contracts from our put rider service. Okay, where we, every closed position, closed recommendation, um, we have four open right now. So we've closed 294 with four currently open trades as winners. Um, credit spreads and iron condors, 2022, how are we doing? This has been a brutal market this year, right? Bear market conditions, high volatility. This is what usually chops up people who try to trade credit spreads and iron condors. So I'm gonna show you how we've done. We've issued 25 recommendations to our members and we've closed 23 of them out as winners this year. That's a 92% win rate. And on 20 contracts is nearly a $9,000 profit. And this is all scalable. You can obviously trade as many contracts as your account size allows. Um, but this is, this is what's possible with our strategies and our adjustment techniques. Um, in fact, we, we've only had to adjust, I think, a couple uh, uh, credit spread trades this, this year. Um, and this is what, kind of what the alerts look like, um, some examples. So you get the annotated chart, you get the exact action to take the strike prices to sell, um, you get everything you need, the, the stop loss orders, the closing price. Here's a stock alert example on Morgan Stanley. Again, annotated charts. You get all the instructions, no guesswork, and you get the adjustments when needed.
So if anything needs to be adjusted, you get that. So we're throwing in 12 months of our top three options and stock alert services, and that normally retails for $1,499. We're throwing in our trade adjustments included with the services valued at $299. Um, again, these are the retail values. If you were to buy this from us directly off our site, um, our professional trading series online course, we're gonna throw that in as well. So I taught you some of our best option strategies and adjustment techniques today. We only had 45 minutes together today. We have a lot more and we've compiled all of that into an over nine hour online course that you can watch at your leisure. Um, normally that retails for 97. We're, we're also throwing that in the package today. Um, you get access to our uh, private Facebook group with all of our Altos members we, uh, that, that trade these strategies and um, you can interact with them and speak with them in the group. Um, that's a private membership group uh, that we offer at 199. Um, you get uh, all the trade adjustment techniques uh, in our courses on how to fix losing trades. Um, normally those retail for $900. Um, and I didn't even mention this, but there's no day trading necessary here, guys. We issue all of this after market close. So if you have a full-time job, um, if you, uh, you know, are retired and out, you know, playing golf or enjoying life and you don't want to be tied to your computer, all of this, all of our alerts come out after market close. So you can, you have basically the whole evening and the next morning before the market opens to go ahead and enter these with your broker. And again, you get 12 to 15 real-time trade alerts per month. We guarantee an 80% or greater win rate. Um, and ultimately, we want to continue our journey with you and help you learn to trade stocks, futures, forex options with consistency. Whatever you trade, we do it all. We do it all, right? So this is just a small slice of the pie uh, today that we're showing you but a very valuable package. So the retail price is uh, over $3,800 on this package today, and we're slashing it by 92%. So you get everything here, um, all of it unlimited access and 12 months of our top three alert services for only 297. Killer deal, we're only doing this today. It's good through midnight tonight or when the first 20 seats are sold and then it's off the table. So it's going back to retail price uh, once the 20 seats are gone or, um, midnight tonight, whichever comes first. So if you want to claim one of the seats, we'd love to have you on board and we continue to work with you. altostrading.com forward slash bundle, and you can uh, claim the 92% off special today. Um, so I, I ran a, just a couple minutes over, um, and I don't want to take time from the next presenter. Uh, let me go ahead and get to our contact screen so you can have our contact information if you have any questions. Um, there is a, um, a money back guarantee. So let me just get to that. And then um, I obviously had a little bit more to get through, but ran a little short on time. Um, so we have a 90 day guarantee. So if you uh, aren't profitable in the first 90 days, uh, we're gonna provide a full refund, no questions asked. So just show us your statement. You didn't make money with us. We don't, you know, we don't wanna take your money obviously. So um, full 90 day money back guarantee there. Um, once you join, you're going to be added to our members list. You're going to get all of the confirmation emails and access to the members area for the training course, um, as well as a couple special bonuses that we're throwing in. That'll all be available to you um, once you join. Um, but here is our contact information if you guys have any questions, because um, uh, I know that we don't have a lot of time for questions today. So you can email us support at altostrading.com. Um, or call us toll free 800-895-9348. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to help you there. So again, altostrading.com forward slash bundle. I believe Anna's put that in the chat box for you uh, to easily access the page um, for 92% off on this incredible package. So Anna, I'll pass it back over to you. Sorry, I ran a little bit over, um, but thanks so much for having me and thank all to all of you for uh, for attending. I hope you got a lot out of it so much and good afternoon everybody i know you've already been taking in some great trading information here i'm going to seek to continue that trend and we're going to talk about a really simple option strategy that i've been using for a number of years in all kinds of markets to find home runs on the upside and the downside with options and so we're going to talk about how you can do a really simple straight options purchase no spreads required on this strategy, just really all about finding the right moves when they're starting to really power ahead. So I'm gonna walk you through that today uh, and definitely just wanna remind you as we get started that everything I share with you here today is based on our proprietary research. It's intended for illustrative purposes only. These should not be considered specific advisory recommendations. So just really focus on the whole education element here, build a solid foundation 
that you can grow from. Stock and options trading, of course, as you know, have large potential rewards, but also large potential risk. The past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. You can check out our terms of use on our bigtrends.com homepage for more information here. So what I'm going to focus you on is something that, you know, actually I didn't do at first when I launched bigtrends.com back in 1999. I said, I'm not going to be quite so aggressive. I'm going to, uh, you know, I was saying I want to really show people how this works in a more conservative way. So we were buying more expensive options. But as I think we've grown and gotten better and better at finding the trends, we can be more aggressive finding these relatively cheap options, options priced at a buck or less per contract. Now remember one contract controls 100 shares, you gotta multiply times 100, so a $1 option means it would cost you $100 to control 100 shares. Uh, that gives you tremendous leverage and it really has been on fire here in 2022. Obviously, um, you know, anything can happen in the future. Our job is to help you adapt to whatever the market and the major stocks that have options on them are doing. So we follow really the top tier of the top couple hundred names in the optionable universe to say like whether it's the Apples, the Microsofts, uh, you name it, that, that are tradable uh, that we can pop in and pop out of over a few days to no more than typically a couple of weeks. So I'm going to share with you today my top three momentum filters, not just one uh, momentum fil filter indicator, but actually three that really I require all three to line up. I call it like the planets aligning. You know, when you get a solar eclipse, it's super powerful. You don't want to look right into the into that. It'll burn your eyes. It's so powerful. That's the kind of power we want in our in our options trades, speed of movement is essential and that we know that they have a good chance to get there fairly quickly and, and fairly dramatically uh, in, in a number of cases. Uh, so we'll walk you through these indicators and just to give you a quick overview, it's the CCI, the Commodity Channel Index, but actually applied to st individual stocks, what I call big trends bands, which I'll go into more detail on, and then uh, average directional movement, the ADX trend indicator as a confirmation that there's plenty more life in that trend. So we'll get into all those, but you know, we're going to give you a lot of case studies, trades, and, and a special uh, home run trading package for today, just for Investors Expo attendance. So hang around for that. It's my best ever offer to get you started taking advantage of these home runs. We call it Grand Slam options. Uh, so if you don't know me, I founded Big Trends back in 1999. I've been trading myself, pretty much caught the trading bug while I was at Duke University. And once I graduated there, I went into an analyst role with the nation's biggest options newsletter at the time at the start of the 90s and throughout most of the 90s and then launched big trends in 99. So we've seen bull and bear environments and, and taken advantage of that for thousands of different clients around the world. My big thing is that it's nothing that's seat of the pants. It's all got to be based on data, time-tested research data, quantitative analysis, Blessed to be inducted in the Traders Hall of Fame in 2007. Uh, and so bottom line is that hopefully can share some things that allow you to get some shortcuts to maybe some of those early lessons learned uh, that, that you don't have to pay the tu market's tuition if you can learn these lessons of what, not just what to trade, but also what not to trade. So let's start with some examples. And, uh, and uh, this is one just from this past week or so in, uh, in the last couple of weeks now in, in uh, AFLAC. Uh, one of my associates said, what does a talking duck have to do with options trading? And it's like, well, AFLAC is the, is the, is the name of those, those commercials you see with that, the talking duck. And bottom line is it symbol is AFL. What's great about this example is that it shows you don't have to just do this on tech stocks. You can do it on anything that trends. And remember, that's why I named my site bigtrends.com because I realized even back in 99 when everybody was pitching day trading as the path to wealth, that why would I limit myself to just a one day hold if I saw a move that could keep going in my favor for multiple days, if not sometimes multiple weeks. So our focus is much more swing trading oriented here. And what we're looking at here, the circle is where we got into this option. The stock was trading in the neighborhood of just over 60 bucks. Okay, stock 60 bucks. And so this was back on August 9th. And you see that we're recommending to buy the AFLAC September 62 and a half calls. This is now a closed trade, but I'll just show you what this alert looked like. We said, look, we want to get into this. Um, we sent out a e real-time email alert. You should not be trading this now. We're out of it. But uh, August 9th, 11.06 a.m. Wall Street time, we said get into the AFLAC September 62 and a half call up to 65 cents or less. Some clients got down into as little as 50 cents, but our average entry we calculated 
over that next hour after we sent that alert was 56 cents. So these are real world entries and exits based on the typical subscriber experience, getting in and getting out. We've got hundreds of folks getting in and out of that. I limit the service so I don't put too many people in, but we can handle lots of, of contracts with these very liquid active names. Now, so Aflac is a, it was a very cheap option. We can remember we can buy it up to a uh, hundred dollars a contract. We only paid fifty six bucks a contract, about half of our maximum. Why? Because the September sixty call was trading for more than a buck. The sixty two and a half calls are next choice, and that's pretty typical. If anything, it's actually fairly close to the stock price. The stock near sixty, we're less than five percent out of the money, right? Um, you know, two and a half points above the current price of the stock. You say, why would you buy an out of the money option? Isn't that all time risk? It is all time risk, but the idea is that if we can get a quick move in our favor where it goes from out of the money to a lot of times, doesn't even have to get to the strike price to get our first target, which is a double. So in this case, we got a little bit of our double um, a couple days later here, the morning of the 11th of August, you see it had popped up. You see we're cashing out, in this case, right about at the strike price of 62 and a half. So that out of the money option is now at the money. Our $56 a contract is now worth over 112, which would have been our essentially our target. I think we had it out at 115, 1.15 or $115 to sell half of our position at a double or better. What does that do by selling half of your position out, half of your contracts when they double? If you think about it, if you put a thousand bucks into a trade, it's now worth 2,000. By taking half of your contracts, take that original $1,000 of your risk capital, put it all back in your pocket, back in your trading account, in cash, you now have the proverbial free trade. Now, some people call that the market's money. I've never believed that. It's still your money and my money on these trades. We're saying, look, we want to know that we're uh, now taking the risk out of the trade, but that should free you up, not just financially, but psychologically to go for the bigger gain potential, which in this case for us is targeting the next target is a triple, a 200% gain or better. And the final target is a quadruple, a four bagger, clear the bases, grand slam, uh, and, and make four times your money on that last target, okay? So we sell half our remaining position at a triple, half of it at a quadruple when we get the chance. We won't always get that chance and we'll walk you through numerous examples of how we manage trades kind of regardless of what the market does. But let's talk indicators for a minute. Why were we getting in to Aflac when it was just starting to move August 9th? We were seeing that this blue line is called the CCI Commodity Channel Index. We'll explain all these in a little bit more detail in a few. But And the red line is called the percent R, the percent range. Larry Williams developed that. Um, Donald Lambert developed CCI to track futures, but I use it for individual stocks. And when it started to break out here, the beginning of the day on the 9th, this is actually a 30-minute chart. These are pulled off a trade station, but you can use any platform to execute your trades and to track your trades. The point being that we use this and say, okay, that first that first high, that first half hour, we got to close above it that following half hour. And so we were sending that trade uh, soon after that, got it out there just after 11 a.m. and said, we want to be on board Aflac betting to the upside. Now notice, what's the philosophy of these indicators? If we break out in, into the quote, overbought territory, for percent R, it's above the 80th percentile here. We've got that 90 level mark, but that, that green 80% line is sort of the first threshold for us. For CCI, it's a plus 100 threshold for bulls. So the blue line has to go above that plus 100, and then it has the stock has to then keep going up. So if a stock, think about this for a second, folks. If a stock goes overbought, most of us have been trained, most of you have been trained to say if overbought, is, is it good or bad? If I tell you something's overbought, let me just ask that question real quick, get you involved here. When you hear overbought, do you want to buy it or do you want to get, get out and sell it? What do you think? What's your bias? Because most of the conventional training, while I'm letting you answer that in the chat, most of the conventional training is that overbought means you shouldn't bet on it, continue to go up. You should think it's overbought implies it's gone too far, right? Just the name overbought. And yet that's in this, in these, all these things that you're going to watch today from me, the one thing I want you to walk out of here is saying, you know what, overbought's not bad like I thought. It can be actually powerfully good. Because if it keeps going up, it means the institutions want to buy into this thing. Now, you'll see there are times, especially with percent R, where it looks like it's coming back out of that overbought zone. But these little points are what I call retests. As long as it doesn't close under there, we're still good in that uptrend. CCI, same thing. If it tests into that 100 line, it got close here 
throughout most of the move, but see how it just stayed in that blue line above its overbought threshold. So staying overbought, it's like a rocket launching into orbit, right? If it stays up in orbit, it's going to keep coasting on out there to even higher levels without the gravity of Earth pulling it down, right? It's the same thing with these indicators. When they stay in that area, you've got a powerful uptrend. And what it tells me is that, let's face it, you and I as individuals do not control the markets. It's the institutions that are much more powerful in driving their money, their billions and tens of billions of dollars in and out of different names. When they want to build a position, they can't get in or out all at once. So that's why I believe these trends exist, because if they want in, they're going to keep buying as they see that the trend is in, is in motion and they know they need to get more exposure to it. They want to make money like you and I do. And you can see that's why I believe that these persistent, strong overbought periods where it just never comes back out of that overbought zone for days, in this case, on a 30 minute chart. We're talking about every 30 minutes on a daily. That's 13 bars in one day. This thing lasted for like a week. We were only in it for three trading days to get all three of our targets. So the point is, you see, of course, that first little pause would have would have tested some people, but we knew that, hey, that's still holding up. We're still okay. And then after those first couple of days, those next couple, you can see we're the best of the best part of that. Okay, so, so the point being that, let me get back to where we were here, but bottom line is that that uptrend is what we're all after as, as directional traders. If you say, well, I'm not good at direction, I'm better with non-directional strategies, you could still use these uptrends to use, do put credit spreads on if you wanted to, but you don't want to be getting a fixed small amount gain that's predetermined. You can't get the unlimited upside in theory that, that a buying a straight call option gives you. So why would I why would I cut my profits short and take a quick 20 or 30 or even 40 or 50% gain in this when it's on its way to a 300% gain? Don't cut your profits short. We'll talk about how we cut losses. But the 300% mark is about where I say that's pretty that's pretty extended and and his, historically it could keep going but it could also flip on us um, and we don't want to let that nice profit slip away. So the beauty is this, is that it's not just sort of second tier names that you might not have heard about as much like Aflac. It's also big, biggest of the big stocks like Apple, you know, multi-trillion dollar market capitalization. And it still moves like a young growth stock, especially with these options trades. So you can see here, we got a signal on Apple here earlier this month, August 3rd, getting that breakout in both of those indicators, we'll get into ADX as another confirming tool to support this. And then you see that basically Apple, you know, just steadily launched after a couple of retrace uh, periods over this first couple of days that we held it. One of the things we won't do is we won't hold a trade longer than five trading days. If we're waiting and it's just dead flat after five trading days, we're gonna blow that position out, probably take a loss on the option on this flat stock or the stocks against us a little bit after the five days we'll blow it out. Sometimes we'll even blow it out sooner than that. But the idea is that, look, if the structure to us still looks like it's pretty good here, we're okay to hold Apple. And then you see it start to take off. Our first target of 101% hit here hit um, on August 12th. So it took a little over a week to get that first target right there of 101%. So now you've got your free trade. You sold half your position at a double. See what we paid for it? By the way, the stock was trading about 164 and we bought the 180 strike calls out to the September 16th, September monthly options expiration, September 16th. So this had about six weeks to go before it would expire. And so that we usually go about a month out, give or take. And so the idea is, that, okay, that's a lot of time where Apple is not going to lose a lot of time value while you're waiting over those first few days for it to get going because we paid 77 bucks a contract. Everybody knows that Apple tends to launch uh, their new iPhone, so, so I think it's been determined it's going to be September 7th. So everybody knows that first couple weeks of September, you're going to get that kind of news. We're going to see the value in this option hold up pretty well with that pending news. But we're playing it not for news. We're playing it for the trend move even in front of the news. You've heard the old phrase, buy the rumor, sell the news. We see that a lot with events like Apple's next iPhone launch that wouldn't be surprised if it sells off after that event. It wouldn't be because anything was disappointing in the event itself. It's just that people have been buying in front of it and eventually want to cash out at some point, right? So the idea is that, okay, you want to be like the, the, the smart money and say, let's cash out ahead of that news. Our 205% profit you see was hit 
um, just a couple days after that here, the morning of August 17th. So we're getting out of that 205%. And then our final target was hit as, as they confirmed that date of September 7th, right there at that short-term peak on Apple, about 175. As you know, Apple's trading closer to 168, 169 now. So we were smart to cash out of it here back on the 17th, a little over a week ago. So, um, so we took that money and ran. So think about it. The September 180 calls, the highest the stock got was about five points underneath, out of five points out of the money near 175, give or take. How can you cash in on an option from 77 cents turning into something that's worth like a, a little over three bucks? And you say, well, three bucks, it should, shouldn't it be at 183? That's at the expiration. Uh, we, these, these options still hold plenty of time value well ahead of that expiration. And so that time value gets more valuable if the stock is a lot closer to the strike price. And in this case, you see the stock's made what? From 164 to 174, 175, it's made a 10 or 11 point move, which is essentially what? About a six or 7% move at most. And we've turned that 7% move into a th up to a 302% gain. So you start to figure out your leverage on these can be 40 or 50 to one pretty easily. Um, and the faster we get that move, the more dramatic the leverage ratio will look like. But you see that really the, the, the sweet spot is the second half of this move where CCS staying overbought, percent R only had a couple little retests in here, kept us on board. And you see, we never got flushed out on our way to 302%. Another recent one on plug power calls. You know, as you know, we had that news where the Congress uh, kind of surprisingly came to agreement for once and passed uh, that reconciliation bill along with the quote Inflation Reduction Act. We'll see about that. But you know what? There are beneficiaries in that bill. One of them is renewable energy. As, as we know, like California is talking about outlawing now uh, uh, gas powered cars after the mi middle of the 2030s, like around 2035, they wanna see no more gas cars, uh, new cars being sold. Big, big, big developments happening, right? Well, you know, bottom line is that Plug Power was a clear beneficiary of this. It broke out that very first bar of that thir first 30 minutes of July 28th. And we don't buy right there. We say, look, mark that high, and then tell me if it gets through that high in a future 30 minute bar. This one did three bars later. Uh, so about an hour and a half later. These are candles, of course, candlestick charts. But the point is the same, which is that it's getting continuation after the first morning gap. How many times have you seen it where you get a morning gap and then it just fades? It just, it just fizzles. That's where overbought can be bad because it doesn't follow through. It doesn't tell you that the institutions want to keep buying it. You can see then it retraces back down to our retest zone. You see the retest here, we come out of the overbought area. When I first started to trade this many years ago, I used to get nervous and say, oh, it's coming out overbought. I want it to stay overbought. I would bail too early in my actual trading. And I started testing this and saying, you know what? These retests have a lot of value. It's why I actually switched to percent R many years ago and then I added CCI in later. We'll get more into those, but you can see another retest phase coming in uh, a few days after that. Sometimes they happen on different uh, bars or candles. You see it's all around that same support level near 22. Notice we have bought the 24 strike calls in plug uh, power, PLUG's a symbol, um, out into the third Friday of August. And we had bought that, you can see here, with only a few weeks to go before expiration. So one of my rules becomes that if we haven't at least doubled our position, by the first Friday of the expiration month, which in this case would have been August the 5th close, then we would blow the position out by the close of that bar, August 5th. Well, you can see we got our 101% right before that, the morning of August 4th. Our 200% was achieved the morning of August 5th on my normal kind of bailout day. Got 204% on that second. So you see our first target, 100% plus, second target, 200% plus, final target, 300%. 302% in this case hit uh, the following Monday morning on that gap up. And you see, this is why you take money gradually off of trades that are working for you. You don't want to take all of your profits too quickly. You tend to want to be a little bit more vigilant on getting rid of your losers more quickly while hanging on to your winners. Most people do the opposite. They take a 20 or 30 or 40% gain thinking, I don't want to, I don't want to let a winner turn into a loser. I'm, I'm 
you can't go broke taking a profit, right? Well, you can have problems if you take 20% gains and then you take 50 or, or bigger losses, right? Minus 50, minus 60, minus 70. We tend to try to keep our losses between that 25 to no more than 50% zone, but it could be more um, and it could be less. The, the idea is that, you know what, this is why you don't want to overcommit your capital on any one trade. Smart capital allocation. We say five to no more than 10% of the capital that you are trading in the service should go into each new trade. So it keeps you really focused. We see plug power, another beauty, and rung the register here, August 8th. So these are fresh examples of stuff that's working in today's markets. In, in the summer chop that I saw someone talking about how choppy the market is, and it's like, there are opportunities all of the time. It's it, the, One of my sort of beliefs is that the market is a constant flowing stream of opportunities. If you miss one, don't chase it. Don't get, don't get onto something too late wait till the next one if you're a new subscriber we always tell people don't buy something that we've been into for a few days wait for the next fresh trade know that those opportunities are going to come we tend to call out between six and eight trades a month for our grand slam traders we care a lot more about quality first than quantity i don't want to make a trade every day if it's not the right thing to do do the right thing in your trading you will find that it will bear you out over time as the the right way to trade for quality first. Okay, so a Norwegian cruises, NCLH is a symbol. We only got up to 204% on that one. You saw we're getting our breakout. This is back in late March. As hopes for the reopening trade were growing, right? We know since that these stocks haven't performed too well in the bigger picture. This is why, in my view, buy and holding is out. You know, why buy and hold through, you know, the, these kind of markets, um, you know, when you can take advantage of these quick swings get doubles, triples, even quadruples. In this case, we paid 74 bucks. And that means we, so think about it. If you're putting a thousand bucks into a trade, 74 bucks a contract. Uh, so you say, okay, well I can get in the neighborhood here of about 13 contracts, right? 12 contracts are costing me about 900 bucks. So um, 13 is gonna cost me 975 ish, 974, whatever. So basically the idea is that, um, you know, just under a thousand, you got 13 contracts. When you get the double, 102% is achieved. You can see from the 28th, cashed out two trading, three trading days later, the morning of the 31st, okay? Then we're saying, okay, sell half your position on an odd number of contracts. If you're more conservative, we say sell one more than the average. You can't sell six and a half contracts. So you sell seven contracts if you're conservative, six if you're more aggressive. But bottom line is that you've gotten your risk capital back on when you sell seven of those contracts. So you say, thanks very much. I, I'm now assured that I can't lose money, even if the rest of my position went to zero. Okay. So we sold half of them out there around a buck and a half. And then you see the stock paused a little bit, went through another one of these retest phases right off of that low. And then off to the races again, we rung the register at 204%. The morning of that trade, so that was a 204. We got up to about 250, didn't quite get to our 300, and then it reversed down on us. And this was actually on our last day that we were like to hold these April options, which was the first Friday of April. So uh, we'll talk more about that in a few, but what we cashed out in the last piece there we were Xing out at the 98%, okay, 98% on that one. So we got 102, then 204, then 98, all in six trading days. Okay, so a classic swing trade is about a week. This is a one day more than that. There's usually five trading days in a week. So those are all bull examples. And we wanna show you how this works for bearish when you buy put examples when the market or the stock drops. Sure, that can work this, the exact same way. As you know, sometimes market drops are even more profitable more quickly because the speed of movement on the downside it's like stocks take the escalator up and then sometimes it seems like they take the elevator down right a little too fast and and just like a hard quick waterfall kind of a move sometimes so our system is now saying okay now we're going for the bottom 20 percent of the percent r readings here you see how we're saying oversold to that first phase there our cci came on and confirmed it our adx was confirmed as we broke down into that minus 100 CCI threshold and then kept going. So that first breakdown, then the follow through, stocks trading in the neighborhood of the mid 40s, 44-ish. We're buying a 35 strike put, some nine points or about 20% below the current price of the stock. And you're saying, how's it gonna get there? Well, it doesn't have to, like we said, if we get that quick speed of movement in our favor. We paid 90 bucks a contract, 90 cents or 90 bucks to control 100 shares. 
So in theory, you could buy on a thousand bucks invested up to 11 contracts and not go over that thousand bucks. And you can see first move down. Okay, we don't get our profit target of a double as our first target. It retraces back up at first near where we got in and we're not making really any money at that point. And, but we said, look, don't panic. We don't put price stops on these trades to start because if you do with these cheap options, you'll get whipsawed too much. And we don't want you to turn a 100% eventual winner and end up with a, a, a loser because you got stopped out not following our rules. So then this, um, you can see this next day, which was just a couple of days after we got in, you can see that we're cashing out as the stocks moved down to about 41. We're saying, thanks very much, you know, we'll take the double and now we have a free trade. It goes a little lower, then it bounces back up, then it goes a little a little lower still, but then you see you get this reversal, you say, oh, shouldn't you have known that it was double or triple bottoming here? Well, that's not really, our, our approach is not to try to find, quote, patterns, head and shoulders, double bottoms, et cetera, is to say, look, follow the money management rules, you've got a free trade, don't let it turn into a loss. So when it starts to give back too much of its profit, in this case, it was a little bit more dramatic than we would like. We took 16% and change on the second half of the position. Now, if you hadn't sold the first half of the double, you'd be kicking yourself, right? Because you're like, oh man, I let most of my profit slip away. But in the search for the 200 and 300% gains, sometimes we got to give it a little bit of room, a little bit of a chance and be willing to say, you know what? When you add up two half positions, one at 100% gain, one at 16% gain, 116 divided by two gives you an, a, a gain on average here of 58% and change over eight trading days. Would you be happy with 58% over eight days? I would hope so. You know, it's not the biggest gain, but it's a healthy profit for a week and a half of work, okay? So that's not bad, um, you know, but the point is, is that not every trade is gonna win. Let's show you one that didn't take off like we thought it would and what, how do we manage it? This was Marvel Technology, MRVLs Assemble. Stocks trading near 75 are, this is showing a daily chart, but our intraday system was picking it up as a, looked like a breakout. We thought it could launch to even higher highs. We've got our big trends band shown up here in red. And you can see that when we, when we have a close back underneath it, that low becomes our key retest bar. And you can see it was hanging in on that retest bar for the next few days. So we actually held it past our usual five day window. Cause I said, it's still holding in here. This, this company's gonna report earnings here in about a week and a half. Let's not get out just yet. Let's give it a chance to pop back up before the earnings. Now here's the earnings rule. If we haven't doubled our money before earnings, I will never hold a trade in the earnings just out of hope. You know. Um, we would say, look, okay, this one actually broke down a couple of days before the earnings and we had to say, get rid of it. It's not holding up, take the 23 and a third percent loss and move on. But if it was a day before earnings and we're, even if we're profitable, if we're flat, if we're down, don't, don't use earnings as a, as a hopium type of a, of a, of a, of a desire to say, you know what, just cut and run. In this case, we would have been bailed out by the earnings, but that's not good trading. Okay, that's just basically randomness at that point in my view. And so I'm after when the trend advantage is with us, we want to ride that trend. When the trend advantage is ended, we want to get rid of that and say, let's follow the structure of the markets. We took the 23 and a third percent loss and said, moving on to the next trade. Don't look back, just look, look at the next opportunity. So a big part of successful trading is getting rid of your problem uh, trades promptly when you're supposed to, not holding on to problems and hoping they turn into opportunities. I'd rather get rid of the problem trade, take the smaller loss and go focus on the next opportunity. Okay, next next play, next trade here. Um, so super quick AMD advanced micro devices example. This was a daily chart signal. And this is focused on a, a prior August, July and August where I like this example because it shows something else happening on the left side that we didn't follow, which was the setup point on the couple of these indicators saying, hey, if it closes above that first high there um, in early July on this chart for AMD, that would be a confirmation to the upside, right? But you see those red candles say we close lower, close lower again. And when it closes lower and says it's not staying in that overbought zone, get rid of it. Don't consider it an active signal. Wait for it to set up again. So the, the next setup came a little over a week later when percent R, um, the CCI in blue, those are signaling as setups right here. We've got to close above that high, or if it doesn't, it's got to at least stay in the overbought territory. CCI stayed overbought, 
percent R just managed to stay overbought right there in the top 20% of its readings, that next bar. And then, of course, it exploded higher the second bar after the setup. This is a daily chart, remember. So stock's about 62. So we're in there the next morning saying buy the, we wait for the close above that prior resistance in the mid-50s. Blast off to 62. We say we want to get into the August 75 calls about a month out till expiration. We paid a buck, 100 bucks a contract for an option that was about 20% out of the money. That seems expensive, right? With a stock at 62. But notice in the first day, by the way, we bought at the top of that first morning's bar there and we were wrong that first day. Went from 62 intraday down, down to about 58, closed about 59. We're losing a little money on that day. If you use a 20 or 25% stop, you're going to whipsaw yourself out of what turns into a great trade. So we say, look, just, just don't put a price stop in there. We'll alert you when to get out. But in the meantime, saying you've got a double target, which gets achieved along with the triple target gets achieved that very next trading day, which is a Friday in the end of the close. And I even had some subscribers who said, hey, why don't we take profits here into the weekend? We don't want to walk in on Monday, and they're like, look, you've got a free trade already. You've taken half out of the double, another half of your remainder out of the, of the triple, and we're shooting for 300%. We got 300% that next Monday morning. So, um, so you know, about two and a half trading days here. Um, so bottom line is that you can see that it's it's about, and the ADX, I didn't talk about that yet, the green line here, that's average directional movement, ADX. What does the green line show? When ADX is just starting to turn up off a relatively low level here, that was validating that this is a start of an uptrend. Even though that first candle, when we got in, we were wrong for that first day. As I often say, one candle, one in this case, one day doesn't make a, a trend on the daily chart, right? There are going to be retracements. There are going to be pauses. You can't panic on that. You have to say, let's focus on where um, the trend is telling us it's likely to go. And ADX trending up uh, with the positive net new highs going up, the net new lows in red going down, positives in blue, that's a sign of an uptrend, right? Now you can see if we if we in this case think about with with AMD, for example, we just looked at, we paid a buck. So that means you could buy 10 contracts and if you get all three targets, a double, a triple, a quadruple, it works out to like seventeen hundred and fifty dollars in profit off of a thousand dollars invested. The thousand turns into like twenty seven fifty overall. So you make $1,700 plus. These examples are before commissions, of course. But commissions, as you know, have come down dramatically. No more ticket charges. You could do this with as little as four contracts for as little as 400 bucks per trade to start. When you start stacking up the gains and losses, when we put in up to 1000 bucks a trade, this example just looks at about the last month or so. We, we did this a few days ago. So look at the last month from 720 to 820 this year as you know for a lot of people 2022 has not been a good year for grand slam option subscribers it's been a wonderful year even just in the, it's been a wonderful last month or so you can see past 30 days look back we might have made six or seven no more than eight trades probably in that period and yet those trades on a thousand bucks invested per never holding more than a few up three open i think is, is our maximum open at a time 4745 gross profit dollars before commissions even if you're buying 10 contracts a side, that shouldn't cost you more than 10 bucks a side buying and then another 10 bucks on the way out. And for a lot of people, it could cost you a lot less. I know some people are paying 50 cents a, uh, a contract, no ticket charge. Um, so it's a beautiful thing. Think about this. You could do this on as little as a few thousand dollar portfolio. We just used a $5,000 model portfolio as an example. Start with 5,000, you're putting in a thousand bucks a trade. That'd be 94.9%, almost doubling your money in just a one month span. We don't, that's not typical. We wouldn't expect that to happen every month. You can call us and you can look at our full multi year track record and you'll see, you know, a really good uh, performance through all kinds of different market conditions. So don't let market conditions be your excuse. Some call it a reason, I call it an excuse not to trade. It's basically a lot of people are out there kind of, fantasy trading and not you know really willing to put the the real dollars on the line the beauty of this is that you can start small and then you can scale it up as you grow your not just your account but grow your confidence grow your understanding of our grand slam options system it's super powerful stuff and it's super focused so we're not going to have you just constantly in the markets having to worry about things so let's talk about these filters and the indicators and in just a little more depth a commodity channel index or CCI developed by Donald Lambert at the start of the 1980s 
he did it to trade commodities. I've shown it to work on a lot of big name stocks, especially in the growth stock realm, or at least the growth phase of these stocks when they're starting to really kick up. Why do I like CCI so much? One of the reasons is it's different than a lot of other indicators that tend to put more weight on closes than anything else. This indicator, Lambert said, take the high plus the low plus the close divided by three, and he gets what, what he calls it the typical price for that day. So of course, if it closes at the high, you're gonna have an upward bias, two highs plus a low divided by three. If it closes at the low, it's gonna have a, lo a lower bias, and then you average out those individual daily readings over a, a typical average, whether you look at 20 bars, 50 bars, 100 bars, whatever you like to look at. Some people look at nine bars. My settings are very unique. When you, when you subscribe, you get all my settings uh, and how I encourage you to follow along with these trades on your end too. But like I said, you don't have to have that ability as long as you have the ability when we call it a, a new buy signal or exit to get in or get out with your preferred broker. So remember, CCI, the way we're trading it is that overbought's not a bad thing. We want it to go overbought and the institutions keep piling on. That says it's a powerful uptrend. You want to be in calls in that. Oversold, when the institutions are starting to bail, watch out below, they can bail a whole lot more. Um, so that's what we're looking for. ADX, average directional movement developed by Wells Wilder, same guy that developed the RSI indicator uh, that everybody knows as an oscillator, basically is a trend indicator for ADX. And what we look at is, Okay, if you're getting more positive directional movement, that's the net new highs lines going up. You're not getting any new lows. The net new net new lows line is also saying we're not getting any of those, so it's going up too. You know what that's called? That's called an uptrend, right? The ADX is going to be going up, and with positive above negative, that would be an uptrend. ADX can also be rising with negative uh, DMI going uh, down to new lows and no new highs. That, of course, would be a downtrend. ADX can be rising in that phase, too. So we can trade in both directions as long as we follow the directional movement lines to see who's winning the war between the bulls and the bears. And then a third key leg of the stool is something that me and my research team developed, the big trends bands to say, you know what, we follow Larry Williams' percent R indicator. And I've always said that, hey, like the other indicators I'm talking about, when it goes over bot, it's, and then it keeps going up. It's not the top of the range anymore. It's the start of a trend. I should call it percent T for percent trend. But Larry, Larry's a great trader um, and a true trading innovator. And uh, you know, I've communicated a lot about this and other tools. And bottom line is that there's so many different ways to use good indicators. Just have to know what works and not just for you, but also based on the data over thousands of and many years and in our case, a lot of times decades of data. So bottom line is that overbought is not a bad thing. It's actually powerfully good. It's where the power trends occur. Some would say, oh, you made this money on Baidu, 100, 200, 300 percent in four trading days, but you left all this money on the table that kept going over the next couple of days plus. But the point is, is that I've learned sometimes the hard way that, as you know, bulls and bears get rich, but pigs get slaughtered, right? Let's not be, let's not be um, staying too long and be hoggish. Let's say, let's take the money and run steadily, but still at a healthy 100, 200, 300% potential profit. The top 20% of percent R readings, why does that 20% number resonate? Because you've heard of the 80-20 rule, right? The, the Pareto principle. It's the same concept here. We're looking for the best of the best. Why do the top few percent control so much of the wealth? It's because what they're doing is working and it keeps working and it keeps growing. And so this minority of these signals will give us the majority of our profit opportunities. Now keep this in mind, these indicators are so valuable, but the secret to grant some options is beyond just technical analysis. It's also knowing how to combine these filters with my options trading experience of saying, okay, is this option priced right or not for the kind of move that we expect? We use monthly options with this strategy, not weekly options, because we want more stability. Believe it or not, stability is important in your option trades. That added time value will give us a window to take advantage of this. Now, it's interesting, as you heard me say, I'm looking about 30 days out, about a month out from expiration, and yet that's what this chart shows is the most rapid decay. Really, I would say the most dramatic decay is happening out here about 14 days or less, the last two weeks of the options life. Yes, we won't mess with that area. Stay away from that. But if I'm 30 days out, and say I give myself about a week to 25 or 23 days out with the weekend, you're 23, somewhere in this, uh, in this area here, and you say, okay, well, somewhere in this area is about how much time erosion, if we carve it out, I'm willing to accept, okay? So I'll take some erosion of, of decay, but I know that the only reason I'm willing to 
take that time risk is because I know I'm not going to hold it that long if it's not working. I can cut and run, control enough of the time decay risk to bail, still salvage a decent amount of value, and move on. A lot of people say, why not go out 90 or even 120 days? I guarantee you that while the sliver of decay is less, you will pay a lot more for those options 90 to 120 days because it will include an earnings report for any given stock with quarterly earnings, right? It's just about every stock out there. So you're going to pay up for that uh, and, and we don't necessarily want to do that. A lot of times we'll try to get in and out way before earnings and not even have to pay for that earnings volatility. How about an example with AstraZeneca, AZN's a symbol where we got our first target and then we trailed to break even on the rest. So here's one. See our ADX is starting to turn up as we've got the CCI um, in yellow on this chart. It's already been trending for a while in the daily. And then our hourly uh, system in this case picked it up. Our scenario's already been well overbought. So we're not early here by any means. The stock that morning is trading about 55 and a half. We say buy the 57 and a half calls. This next few days, we run it up to the strike price. The 69 cents that we paid per contract um, turned into a dollar 40, and that made us a little over double in just three trading days after. We gave it a chance to keep going. You see what happens instead, it rolls over on us. And by the seventh day, we say, hey, we set our trailing stop here around break even in this case. And we took actually a minus one and a half percent gain on the second half of the position. Remember, that would that would make you kick yourself if you missed a chance to sell half your position at a double. But in this case, selling half at a double, the other half minus one and a half percent, average is about a 50% gain for the whole trade. Uh, for seven trading days. So you have to put it in the context of what you're looking for. Eric asks, how many trades a week? About two a week on average, you know, one to two, about six to eight a month. I'm not a, a hyperactive trader. I'm looking for these really powerful signals when all of these three indicators, the percent R, the CCI, and the ADX, all say that this thing's got plenty of meat on the bone left and this is a nice launch opportunity. So we showed you how, hey, look, not every trade is going to be a winner but it's about having a track record of success over time, controlling risk. Like I said, the five day time stop is an important one. And, and actually sometimes even lately on an intraday system, we might even cut and run by the end of the next day if it's not meeting our criteria. We're very picky about that the indicators need to follow this profile of success. You know, I've been trading options for over 30 years. It's the best system I've seen for buying options premium. There are ways to make money as a buyer. There are ways to make money as a seller. Um, but you want to be making sure that that edge is working for you no matter how you structure your option strategies and your options portfolio. So like I said, if you missed that track record earlier, just looking back over the past 30 days or so, um, you can see on all the closed trades uh, that we had well, up to 1000 bucks invested per trade. Like I said, no more than about eight trades in a typical month. $4,745 adding up all winners and losers before commissions. Uh, on a $5,000 model portfolio, you'd be up almost 95%. Uh, you know, and, and that's not typical. You know, again, you know, we, we want to have you look at as much as you want to. You can call our 800 Big Trends number and you can get our full multi-year tracker if you want to study that. We're happy to have you do it. So you say, okay, so what's the next action that you can take to start taking advantage of these trade alerts? So I've set up something, I call it my home run trading package. And I'll, I'll come back and answer some questions here in a few minutes too. So if you've got other questions on this, pop them in the chat box. So let me show you, just for this uh, special expo here event, I wanted to set this up to say, let's make it really attractive. A lot of times for 12 months, my trade alerts for my Grand Sam Option subscribers, they'll pay uh, several hundred dollars a month, typically 297 as our monthly rate. You know, So over 12 months, you'd be up to almost 3,600 bucks. But it's, we're going to dramatically slash that for you here. When you also get my strategy session video, kind of a quick start, if you will, on how to get going, my settings and rule sheet. So you get every setting for all the key indicators, everything you need to know. And I give you weekly video training. I update every Monday by 6 p.m. Eastern time to have you have a member's access to learn what I saw happening from the past week's trades, what I see happening for the week ahead and how to position yourself accordingly. And of course, we'll send out real-time email updates and text alerts to your smartphone too when you have questions. You also get a dedicated email to me and my analyst team and my research uh, department to say, if you've got a question on a trade, we can walk this through. So not even counting all the educational bonuses, the trade alert value over $3,500. But today, 
only, I'm going to give you the opportunity to get you a one-time investment of just $497, gives you access to the next 12 months of Trade Alerts and all of these educational bonuses here. So you go to this special link here, it's members.bigtrends.com forward slash slam 12. Okay, thank you for typing uh, that in, Anna. Uh, uh, but bottom line is that, um, I see you got the Big Trends site. Thank you for that, Anna. Uh, members.bigtrends.com, I can type it in here, uh, forward slash slam 12. And it's a members, not WW link. So just make sure you note that, that i um, popping it in right now that you look at that and say, okay, members.bigtrends.com forward slash slam 12. So that is something you can copy paste in your browser. And when you do that, this is what you'll see. Really simple page, okay? And it actually scroll down a little bit too because it's got PayPal access here too. So what it says, you're getting 12 months of the Grand Slam alerts. Like I said, about six to eight trades a month. So over the course of a year, we expect to average somewhere in the neighborhood of about 75 or 80 trades in a year. We, we know that quality is the most important thing. If you're making money with a, with us being focused on the best of the best trades, you're going to be a happy subscriber, and 497 is going to be a true drop in the bucket slam dunk when it comes to getting Grand Slam options access for that whole year. And knowing that one of these trades that hits its targets, if you're investing a thousand bucks in per trade, like we showed you, it can make you like 1,700 bucks plus in all three targets 100 200 and 300 percent getting getting achieved you can scale it of course to any size if you did even as little as 400 bucks a trade then you're saying okay you would still have the chance to make uh somewhere in the neighborhood of uh about uh you know maybe 700 dollars off that trade so again still one of these trades can pay for your whole year subscription and you get all the educational bonuses to go with it too so it's a pretty phenomenal value for the quality and the size of uh, of potential on the service. Usually it's priced at least double this price because I know that my subscribers that invest a thousand bucks in per trade should make potentially uh, up to almost a couple thousand bucks off of one trade. So investing a thousand bucks for a year, uh, if you're anywhere serious about getting great trades and learning why you earn and learning how to do this, you can do this literally trade for a living for the rest of your life. It's a pretty phenomenal value to get. So a question came up about um, what is the, uh, like the follow-ups on trades look like. So I mentioned to you earlier, like um, Aflac, like this is not something you should buy now. We're already out of it. I showed you that example earlier that said, look, we said to buy it there up to 65 cents a contract. Then what we do is we say, okay, if you go back and look at my alerts when I just searched AFL, as you see follow-ups that we send out. So we'll say, okay, sell to close half there's that apple trade that we scored on too in there as well so we're out of both of these but we're saying okay once we got in we said okay there's your first target on aflac a dollar 15. uh we sent that just a little bit later um to tell you okay how to manage that trade once we got that target then we said okay you know what we now know that we want to go get a next target working so then we said okay now we need a new target so we said let's raise our stop now we sold half of it out at $1.15, we moved our stop up to 70 cents. And we said target $1.70 on half of your remaining position, which is half of your half or a quarter of your original. And then when that was achieved, we said, okay, we need to go for that last target. Let's see what we did here. We, uh, let's see, I missed one there. So basically, you're just going to scroll through and see where they're all popping up here. And you see, okay, then our final target remaining close was at 2.25 on August 12th from that final alert that we had sent out, okay? So point is, is that, okay, we guide you through. You're never left hanging. Whether it's a winner or a loser, we always tell you what to do next. So you know that you're not gonna get left hanging and wondering what uh, you should do next. Now, also, we get a lot of common questions. What is this option strategy? It's simple. It's buying a call or buying a put. They're typically out of the money, but you know that we're gonna manage that trade, so you're not gonna get stuck riding it out to expiration in nearly every case uh, so we can guide you through that there are no spreads okay we don't want anything complex we want to keep it really simple the kiss principle is where i've made the most money in my 30 plus years of options trading experience and typically it's with these kind of unleveraged uh, unhedged i should say they're plenty leveraged but unhedged uh straight options purchases it's truly taking advantage of the number one benefit of options which is the fairly small amount of capital you have to put up to control that stock 
for a matter of days or a couple of weeks. What size trading account? We tend to recommend a minimum of 5,000. You could probably do 4,000 here if you're doing 10% per trade, uh, at least get to $400 a contract, okay? What's the recommended option price? We will never pay more than a buck or a hundred bucks to control hundred shares per options contract. So if it costs more than that, we'll go find a different strike price or else just not trade it. Like I said, I'd like to see you doing at least 400 bucks to trade so you can get at least the four contracts at minimum so you can follow the profit, gradual profit taking rules. Half out of the double, the next piece out of the triple, the final piece out of the quadruple when we can get it. How many trades will I receive them on average? We say six here is a bare minimum, but six to eight is what I tend to promise. Uh, how long will I be in a trade? It could be anywhere from a couple of days to a few weeks, but the, the the average is probably about a week or so. How do you get the email uh, trades? They're sent to you via real time and email, but also you can get it to your smartphone as a text alert. So once you get signed up, we'll get you the setup details because we put our tech subscribers on different batch lists for different uh, service providers. So we'll use AT&T, Verizon, et cetera, et cetera. Do you get stop loss and profit target levels? Yes, but remember, we're not using a set price stop. We tend to use more of a time stop approach. So that way you don't get whipsawed if you had a price stop get triggered intraday and then you get stopped while the trade goes on to its profit targets. What are the included resources? Remember, you get the Grand Slam Options Strategy Session, the quick start, telling you exactly what you need to do to be set up, ready to trade. Our next trade could come at any moment during the trading day. So we know, typically for us though, we start off a new day, we're gonna wait for at least that first half hour's close and then preferably the follow through by about 10.30. So usually between 10.30 and 11 is when I expect to see the majority of these trades, but they could also come out in the afternoon if we get a later follow through. So Grand Slam settings and rules, you know all the settings for ADX, CCI, percent R, et cetera. Uh, my weekly video training, you get that access even when you get signed up today to my member site where you can go back and watch dozens of those past uh, alert, uh, alert updates and, and weekly videos so you can really get a feel for how this works. And then a dedicated email to me and my analyst team. So it's a phenomenal value here. Um, and one of the things I wanted to mention too is that we get a question about like, oh, well, I'd like to try for a short period. How about three months? I can do three months for 297. That's my best pricing on a quarterly subscription is 297. Well, guess what? 297, if you did that for four quarters, that'd be like almost 1200 bucks. I'm giving you the chance to lock in the next four quarters, the next year's worth of access, 12 months of trailers or a one time payment, an investment of $497. You have to look at these subscriptions as investments that you're making into your financial future. For me, it's important that the investment you make is not just paid back in terms of great trades, but also in terms of great education. I'm a big believer, and that's why we're on 23 years and going strong here at Big Trends, is that, uh, that I'm a big believer that learn while you earn has gotta be the value that we create for you and all of our subscribers. So we're constantly teaching you, so that we're not just giving you fish or giving you trades, we're teaching you how you can do this uh, for the rest of your life to find opportunities. Cause you know how it works. The, the symbols are gonna change over the, over the months and years ahead, but the patterns tend to remain the same. If you can learn how to trade these patterns, you will literally set yourself up to find the next big trend opportunity out there, whatever time frame you like to trade. You can also apply this not just your trading portfolio, but also to your investing portfolio by just stretching out your time frame. From a, if we're looking at a 30 minute or hourly chart for our shorter term trades, you can look at a daily, even a weekly, even a monthly chart with these same techniques that you're gonna learn as, as a new Grand Slam Option subscriber. We're here for you, you get real bodies to talk to, give you dedicated access points, so you know if you've ever got a question, we can help answer it. So it looks like I'm at the end point of my time here. I wanna say thank you to Anna for hosting these. It's such a pleasure to be with you all. If you've got questions, remember one last thing I wanna say before I hand it back to Anna is that you'll notice on our order page when you go to that members.bigtrends.com forward slash slam 12, you'll see our 800 number at the top of the page. It's also at the bottom of the page, but it's an easy one to remember. It's 800 big trends. Okay, so if you forget that number, just remember 800 big trends or you can email us through clientcare at bigtrends.com to um, my client care team. We're here for you. We guide you through every step of any question you've got. We'll make sure that you're up to speed, ready to go, no matter if you've never traded an option or if you've traded for many years. 
uh, we get folks from all different experience levels coming in to take advantage of this and know they're getting tremendous educational value with all these bonuses to go with the trade alert call outs, uh, you know, a couple times a week on average. So thank you again, Anna, for hosting and having me. It's always a pleasure. I'll hand it back over to you.